and he joins me right now, and I can't stress this enough, the absolute legendary Mr. Bob Gale is on the phone right now. Bob, how are you doing? I'm doing just fine, Brad. Thanks for having me having me on this call. Yeah, no, I'm, you know, I'll be honest with you. I'm being 100% transparent. I don't know if I've ever been starstruck before in an interview, but I am 100% geeking out a little bit talking to you today. <laughs> All right, well, we'll uh, I can't tell, so uh, <laughs> you're, you're covering it up very nicely. Okay, well, we're here to talk about the 35th anniversary release of the Back to the Future trilogy now on 4K which is incredible. Um, my copy comes in the mail today, so I'm excited to get home to watch it. But how great do these movies look in 4K now? Oh, it's absolutely amazing. They they look better than they ever looked in the theater. It's the what's what's actually what they can actually capture from the original film negative uh, that just kind of goes away every time you make a film print. Uh, and then when you go back to the to the original source, um, there are things in there that uh, that I'd never seen before. In fact, when we were doing the remaster, um, there was uh, uh, we could actually see a member of the crew uh, standing off to the side in the buckboard runaway buckboard scene in part three. Um, so we actually had to blur that out a little, a little bit. <laughs> So it's so clear you're finding things that we've never seen before. And that was really what you're not was supposed awesome. to see. Yeah, but you're not supposed to even see. And that was what was awesome about even the Blu-ray releases is I started looking in the window and blast from the past. And I'm seeing like a dragnet poster with Tom Hanks that I'd never seen before. So now I'm excited to see what I can find that I haven't seen before. And every time y'all do one of these releases, you find a way for us fans to enjoy them all over again. Like this time you're putting alternate the alternate Future, I believe, is the, what the extras call, where you're showing auditions from people who may have been Marty and Doc. Is that right? Uh, well, not Doc, uh, but uh, Marty and uh, Marty and Jennifer and Biff. Yeah. And one of those, one of those has been making the rounds online is Ben Stiller. So who were some? Who were some of the people who came in who you thought? Because I know originally it was Eric Stoltz. Then we went Michael J. Fox, who knocked it out of the park, but was there anybody in those alternate timelines that you thought really could have had a great grasp at the role, looking back at it now? We we were very seriously considering uh, C. Thomas Howell to play Marty. Um, so, so that was, uh, he was, he was very high up on the list. And, um, but, but no, in terms of, of, of who you're going to see on these, on these, um, on these snippets of, of casting, and and they are snippets. Don't I don't want anybody to think that they're going to get to see you know uh, Ben Stiller do a two minute two minute scene. It's more like you know thirty or forty seconds of, of a scene. Uh, we just want to give you the flavor of, of all these folks. Um, and uh, and again, my uh, thanks to to everybody who agreed to uh, allow their auditions to be on this disc there because there were some people that said no, nah, I don't want I really don't want people to see that. Um, so you'll see you'll you'll see these people and you'll say well uh gee i think i think those guys uh, made the right choice to to hire who they hired <laughs> well i'm excited to see them and one of the things that was really great about the dvds when they first started coming out and y'all put the deleted scenes on and the fan community was abuzz by all these deleted scenes but the one that i've always wanted to ask you about was uh back to the future part two uh, they're in 2015. They're in Hilldale. Old Man Biff comes back. He's in disarray, and then he eventually disappears. Now, the disappearing part was cut from the film, which um, when I saw that, my mind was really blown by the fact that he disappeared, and now all of a sudden I'm trying to put it together, and Stephen Clark on BackToTheFuture.com tells me, you know, Lorraine shot him in the 90s or something like that. But why was the scene uh, originally cut? Do you remember why y'all decided to take Oh, sure, that absolutely. No, that was the idea. The idea was that, the yeah, old Biff had had warped the past in, in such a uh, manner that he returned to a future in which he didn't he didn't himself exist, and so that's why we had him being erased from existence. But we we previewed the movie with that in there, and the audience was very very confused, and there really was no way they they could ever put that together uh, until they saw the movie a second or a third time. So. Bob Zemeckis and I just decided, you know what, let's just have him look like he's having a heart attack or a stroke or something from the 
you know, from the stress of time travel and leave it at that and, and let let bygones be bygones because we didn't want people to be confused about it. Yeah, you know, and I guess that had I not seen the movie umpteenth amount of times, I probably would have put it together when I first saw it either. But I think that looking back at it, what it tells us about the perils of time travel, it really is everything that Doc warned us about, right? That you can go back and what you do in the past will alter your, your ultimate destiny. And I thought it was such a great moment that now that we get to see you on these releases, which is just so cool to me um, to see. And um, tell people uh, other things that they might get on this bonus uh, disc from the 4K release that they haven't seen prior. Well, there is uh, currently at the Hollywood Museum here in Los Angeles, a Back to the Future exhibit of, uh, of props of some of the cars, uh, costumes, uh, artwork, uh, memorabilia. Uh, of course, uh, with COVID, the, the museum is closed, so you can't actually go in and see it right now. But we got in there to do, I, I give a, a little 10 minute tour of, of the exhibit. so. For everybody who can't go, which is everybody, uh, you can see that. We have about 30 minutes of behind the scenes uh, and information about Back to the Future, the musical, which opened in Manchester, England uh, in February. And then, of course, we had to close it in March when the government said uh, they will close in all the theaters. And that, that we expect will be resurrected in London in May. So. Um, you can get an idea of what that's all about. And I got to tell you, it's a fabulous, fabulous show. I was involved with through the whole thing. Uh, and then there's this, this wonderful, uh, this wonderful uh, piece called Could You Survive Back to the Future, which just kind of pokes at all the, all the laws of physics that we violated. You know, it, it asks, well, how much pressure would a speaker actually have to have to blow somebody across Doc's lab. Uh, what would that be like? And the answer is, well, it'd probably kill. It'd probably kill any normal human being. <laughs> oh my God, I love that! What a great idea for the behind the scenes or for the bonus disc to think about the physics of Back to the Future. I remember seeing something on the History Channel a few years ago about the the science behind Batman, and that's what that kind of reminds me of 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 the physics of Back to the Future. That's phenomenal. Out of um. Out of all the things that y'all did, and really in parts two and three, you see the interconnectivity between those two films with little Easter eggs in part two that make allusions to part three. But all three of them have great Easter eggs. What would you say would be your favorite one that you were real proud of, something that you snuck in that people are now still discovering years later? Well, <clears throat> most people have discovered just about everything by now. Uh They've had 35 years after all, <laughs> uh, but there there is one that that I love that most people are never thinking about. They don't look at it, and that is in the first movie when we have we set up the clock tower, save the clock tower, and you look back at the ledge under the clock, the ledge is is completely whole, and then when Marty comes back at the end of of the first movie and he's there on the town square. If you look back at the ledge, it's broken from where Doc had stumbled and broke the ledge. Um, yeah. It's not where anybody's looking, but that's in there and uh, uh, that's a really cool thing. That's a great one. You know, the one that stuck out to me recently that I, I mean, I'm talking three, four weeks ago when I was rewatching the films that I never caught before was in the um, 2015 Hill Valley the, the logo for the Hill Valley Clock Tower Mall is the clock with the lightning bolt going through it. And I don't know how I'd never noticed that. And I thought, what a great little Easter egg. Yep. Uh, yeah, absolutely. They're, they're all, and, they're and, all and in In there. fact, my wife had clocks made for uh, members of the cast and crew uh, with that image uh, as, as the clock. So this is Used it again. <laughs> oh, man, that's awesome. Now, I know, obviously, everyone asks it all the time, so I, I'm not going to ask, is there going to be a Back to the Future 4? Because you, you've been pretty clear on, on your answer on that, and, and I think the fan community respects it fully. But when writing 
Paradox, which was the script for part two and part three. I know there was this flirtation with going to the 60s. And if you ever did, you know, do another installment or when you were working on the, the prior three, did you ever have thoughts of a time period that y'all would want to go to that you never got to? Absolutely. We did. We, we thought about uh, the gangster era, the Roaring Twenties, Prohibition. And in fact, um, if you get your hands on the Telltale Back to the Future game, uh, which is a computer game and also on, uh, I forget whether it's PS, PlayStation 2 or 3 or one, and one of the Xbox consoles. Um, that is the time period where much of the story takes place and it utilized some ideas that Zemeckis and I were kicking around, uh, to do in the sequel. So you can see, um, it's, and it's also, by the way, um, uh, in the IDW comic book series, uh, there is a special, uh, a special graphic novel uh, that, that with a five-part miniseries, uh, and um, you can you can experience it that way. Yeah, the games were great, especially for us longtime fans. They're almost you know sequels in their own rights, uh, and the comic series, the the Biff to the Future comic series is great. So definitely go get all those IDW releases. Um, I just heard you say. Something I read in an article that maybe it was yesterday or the day before. We all knew about the, a lot of us longtime fans knew about the alternate ending that involved the refrigerator. But I had never heard about this alternate beginning because I think the, the opening shot of Back to the Future, I would make the argument that it's top five most iconic opening scenes in cinematic history. Uh, and it's the, the, the panning of the clocks. The almost completely one shot. What was the original idea for that open that y'all scrapped or? or well, the original that? opening. You see, the, the, as you say, the end, the end of the movie, uh, when when the time machine was a refrigerator, and even even the first round when it was a DeLorean, um, they literally had to take the time machine to a nuclear test site um, okay. uh, and harness the actual the actual nuclear energy released by an A bomb test. So that was the that was of course uh, utilized by uh, Mr. Spielberg in Indiana Jones Four: Nuke the Fridge, right? Um, so the opening of, the, of Back to the Future was a scene in a classroom where the class was watching a documentary about these nuclear tests, so that everybody in the audience would be educated about what went on at at these nuclear tests in, in Nevada back in the fifties. And so when we changed when we changed that out, uh, it was too expensive for us to do, um, and we were trying to figure out how we were going to save some more money in the in the movie. Um, Bob and I realized we didn't need to have a scene setting up nuclear test sites because we don't have a nuclear test anymore, and we already had built this wonderful set of Doc's lab. So let's do a little homage to one of our favorite time travel movies, the George Pal Time Machine. Uh, and start with this great opening, long uh, tracking shot over all these clocks and how much you learn about Doc Brown Hill Valley just in those opening two and a half minutes. Yeah, that's, I, I love hearing stuff like that. I just love knowing what the thought process and then And then having to cut something gives you this iconic shot that everybody and their mother knows about. And uh, that's another great scene to look back and see all the little Easter eggs, even with the Harold Lloyd and safety last illusion that we see later on in the film. Such great. I could go on and on and on. But I, I have one more minute with you, so I'm just going to ask, ask you this. Um, and I want to tell you, and I, and I mean this with all sincerity, Mr. Gale, these movies have meant so much to me and so many people. Um, I, I've been with this franchise for as long as I've been alive, and I've found new ways every single year to either show it to someone new or to make a new connection to it, whether that was when my grandmother got diagnosed with Parkinson's. Um, again, I just became even more entrenched and in, in connected to this series. Why do you think Back to the Future has lasted these 35 years, and, and why will it continue to last for generations to come, in your opinion? Uh, to me, I think the, the power of Back to the Future is the humanity of it. You know, people talk about, oh, the car is cool and the special effects and all the bells and whistles. But at the heart of it, is the idea that every human being realizes when they're, I don't know, eight, nine, ten years old, when they come to the realization, oh my goodness, my parents once were children. I mean, that's, that's an incredibly powerful idea. 
uh, realization that, that every human being makes. And then, you know, once you learn about sex and you say, oh, my God, my parents did that. Um, <laughs> and you ask yourself, what did my parents do on their first date? Another question that everybody has asked. And so Back to the Future taps into all of those great human uh, human elements that we all have. Plus, it it reminds us that we do have some control over our own destiny, that the decisions that we make when we're young uh, can change the course of our lives. And we see that played out uh, as George McFly um, you know, learns to stand up for himself and stand up for uh, Lorraine, and uh, he makes a better life for himself just because he's brave enough to do the right thing. I think that that was beautifully said. Mr. Bob Gale, the co-creator of Back to the Future. Of course, you can get the 4K release on your favorite retailer right now. I got mine from Amazon. Find it at the local store near you. Mr. Gale, I 100,000% appreciate you sparing some time for me and talking with me today. I really, truly appreciate it. Oh, you're very welcome, Brad. Uh, 1.21 giga thanks to you. <laughs> <laughs> that is the legendary Bob Gale. Bob, thank you again. And he joins me right now, Don Fullove, also known as Goldie Wilson from Back to the Future. Don, thank you so much for taking the time. I'm so excited to talk to you. Hey, glad to be here. Uh, you know, it's been a long time coming. I'm so I'm so excited to finally get you on the line. I mean, Mayor Goldie Wilson is without a doubt one of the most iconic characters. I think, in cinematic history. Um, and it's so cool to finally get to talk to you. How are things, though, going for you right now during this kind of crazy time that we're living in the world? Oh, well, just out here uh, in good old Hill Valley social distancing. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, as the mayor, you got to touch the people, right? you gotta, you got you to um, make sure everybody is calm, cool, and collected, and I see that you're doing a good job. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> well, let's, let's start from the top, though. You know, um, you're one of the... Goldie Wilson's one of those iconic characters, like I said, but let's start with you. Where did your career begin in acting, and, and, and where were you, you know, born and raised, and where did, when did you get the bug? Many, many moons ago, uh, my mother was a contestant on a show called The Hollywood Square. Wow. And as a little tyke, I went with her to film the show, and quite naturally, they took her off to the uh, soundproof room, and they were doing pre-production for the show, so, you know, People that were there in the audience with contestant members, uh, one of the producers of the show asked me if I wanted to sit up in the square while they rigged the lights and sound. So they put me in Michael Landon's square, and uh, being a precocious kid, I was. For whatever reason, they liked me and asked me a bunch of questions, and the next thing you know, I had an agent. Thus began the career of Don Full of Love. So here you are, you just, you're going somewhere with your mom and next thing you know, you, you have a whole career ahead of you. Um, so were you, a, you're a child actor. So what, what were some of the first things that you uh, worked on? Well, I started off in voiceover. So the very first thing that I ever did was playing the voice of Michael Jackson on the Jackson five cartoon show. And then I went on to do a bunch of other uh, cartoon series, uh, show called, um, Emergency Plus Four, which is based off of the uh, TV show on at the time called Emergency. Uh, I did a show called Kid Power, which was based on a comic strip called We Pals. And just a bunch of other uh, you know, radio spots and stuff like that. How was it playing Michael Jackson, the voice of Michael Jackson? And this isn't a time where Michael's still the biggest thing in the world. Um, how was that getting to play Michael? I was the coolest kid in the seventh grade. <laughs> I'm sure you were. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that but that must have been yeah, a trip for you. Was, were you a big Michael fan? I was. Everybody in the world was a Jackson 5 fan. I definitely was. So to be able to hang out with them, Diana Ross, all the greats from Motown back in the day, Temptations, Marvin Gaye, Barry Gordy, kind of uh, kind of fun for a kid. I, I would imagine I think it that my would mother so... away too. <laughs> yeah, I, I would imagine that would be kind of a of a crazy experience and were, I guess being exposed to it so young, did it, did it feel like, Oh, this happens for every kid or did you know that this was a unique journey that you were on? Oh no. It's obviously it was obvious that it was pretty unique. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, now, uh, I, I know according, according to, you know, online like me, you're a Texas boy, um, uh, born in Dallas. Is that correct? Uh, I was birthed 
in Dallas. I never stayed there. I immediately came, was immediately sent back to Los Angeles where my, my parents live. Okay, so you're you're pretty much a a, a born and bred West Coaster. Oh yeah, my uh, my mother just happened to be visiting Texas when I uh, when I uh, when she went into labor. Okay, okay, that makes sense. So you're you're out there in California. You're playing Michael Jackson. You're the coolest kid in the seventh grade, like you said. And you said you do a lot of cartoons, voiceover work. When was it that you have had your first like on camera, on screen role in a television or or a film? Uh, it was a CBS movie of the week in nineteen. 19- 80. It was called Scared Straight, Another Story. It was based off the documentary uh, Scared Straight about kids being taken to prison so that the convicts could uh, try and scare them into a life of being straight as opposed to a life of crime. So uh, that was the first uh, major role that I had. I played a character named Smash, who unfortunately was not scared straight. <laughs> Didn't work out for him, huh? Didn't didn't work out for the young guy. But the thing about it is the movie was so... uh, The people that cast me in the movie were so impressed with the work that I had done. It was... uh, They were the ones who cast Back to the Future. And uh, they brought me in to meet with uh, Zemeckis, uh, Zemeckis, Spielberg, and, and Gale. Wow. So that's how I got to... That's how I got to... That was the jump to uh, Back to the Future. So you go into this casting session with with Zemeckis, Gale, you know Steven Spielberg, who at the time is a is a kingmaker in Hollywood in most people's eyes. Um, what what was your preparation? Did so you obviously they sent you some sides or something? You knew that you're going to audition for for this character, Goldie Wilson. What was your first impression of the character? Let me ask you that. When you read the script, you saw what you were supposed to go in there and do. What was your first impression of Goldie Wilson? Well, I don't know about most of the people from the cast. I think it was, you know, quite a few of the people from the cast. There was never a script. There was there was only meetings. Um, I there was no script. There was no size. I just went in for a meeting with them, and they were asking me questions that uh, until I actually did the film, I didn't understand what they were asking me questions about. They were asked. They asked me if I knew how to sing, obviously, uh, because they were probably considering the role of Marvin Berry for me as well. And I guess after the meeting, they decided, you know what, you're a better fit as uh, as uh, Goldie Wilson. So I never heard from him for, I guess, I don't know, a couple of weeks. And then I got a call. And uh, your part was offered to me. Wow. that's So you, you didn't know exactly what you're going in for. You just went in for an informal meeting. And, and what was your first impression of, of Robert Zemeckis and Gail and, and Steven Spielberg? How, how, what, describe that meeting from what you can remember. Back then... Video games were just becoming the rage, the arcade-style video games. And I remember going into Universal Studios, and at that time, probably still now, I'm sure, Amblin Entertainment had a compound on the Universal Studio lot. So you're on the Universal Studio lot, and you drive, and then you drive up to Amblin, and it's a whole nother giant gate. And uh, as the gate to Amblin open, and you begin to see the uh, Amblin compound, you kind of get overwhelmed because you're like, holy cow, this is where Steven Spielberg does all of his stuff, the Steven Spielberg. So I get inside, and I remember prior to going in the office meeting with them, it was a room just full of arcade video games to play. <laughs> so That's crazy. That was, the, that was young Don's first impression of uh, the first meeting of Back to the Future. So how long between that meeting did, did it take for you to get the role? About how long do you remember the process being? I, I think it was one or two weeks. It wasn't a long time. And then you um, at, you get cast, and then when you find out that Goldie Wilson, you're, you're not going to play Marvin Barry, that's going to Harry Waters Jr., you're going to be playing Goldie Wilson, they think that you're the perfect fit. Then when you finally see a script and you're, you're getting to understand your character, you're the mayor of Hill Valley in, in the 80s, in the 50s, you're working at Lou's Cafe. What was your impression of, of Goldie Wilson then? Uh, I don't know that I had an impression of Goldie as much as I just did of, of trying to bring the, the, the character to life because of the fact that uh, his main scenes were in the 50s, and the 50s being a highly prejudicial time during our history. Um, the The thought of, of, of a black person becoming mayor of any city uh, was 
absurd. The thought of of a busboy becoming the mayor is absolutely crazy. But the fact that Goldie had the type of uh, internal fortitude and and uh, confidence in himself to instill that confidence into uh, George McFly was a big deal. I didn't realize how big a deal that was because I was just an actor doing a part. And, you know, as history has shown that, you know, that's, I did a lot of guess. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then so you, you're, you're, you're getting ready to, to film and, and the cast is set. And as many people know, Eric Stoltz was the original Marty McFly. Did you work with Eric Stoltz in those six weeks of production? I worked for four of those weeks with Eric. Wow. And did you, did, was there a feeling on set that it wasn't working or did everyone think that everything was going fine? And, it, and this seemed like, okay, we're going forward with this movie. Eric's doing great. I mean, I would hear little whispers and stuff. I mean, you know, I was, I was a day player. Nobody was going to tell me behind the scenes stuff. But just being there and, and just hearing little snips of conversation made me think that, uh, you know, something was in the air. So were you already done um, with all of your scenes for the for the film um, when Michael came in? Yeah, I was already done. So uh, how, this how, was near, I think this was near Christmas of 84. Four, I believe, when uh, Bob Gale's office gave me a call and asked me if I'd like to come back and do it all over again. And that's what I wanted to ask. How hard is that? Because I would think as an actor, you kind of figure out what you want to do. You go in there the day of shooting. Shooting days, as everyone knows, are long. They can go forever. But you have these pivotal scenes in the 1950s. You're really um, our first real link between what we see in 85 and 55. And we see, we're going to see Goldie Wilson become mayor. And you, you put, up, put in your performance. And then you get a call that you got to come back and redo everything. How hard is that as an actor? Uh, it wasn't hard at all. You're an actor, you know, you're, you're paid to act. And, you know, back then I was a young guy and acting is all I wanted to do. I didn't care if it was acting on a, on a street corner as long as I was acting. It didn't matter. And then the opportunity to get it, uh, to do it all over again. And originally I knew that Michael J. Fox was supposed to have been in the lead. Everyone knew that Michael right. J. Fox was supposed to have been in the lead. But uh, Gary, what was his name? Gary David Goldberg, I think, mm -hmm. uh, who was the producer of Family Ties. Um, wouldn't let him go. So the rest, as they say, is history. That's right. And um, and Michael comes in. And did it feel, I guess, the second go around? Did you feel maybe so you said you're an actor? So now that um, you're, you're paid to act, you're coming in the second time. I guess that maybe in in some ways it was even a little bit easier because you knew everybody, you knew uh, you know what you needed to accomplish by the end of the day. So I, I guess was it easier the second time around, or the same, or was there any difference at all? With all due respect, Brad, mm -hmm. I don't even remember the first time around. <laughs> really? Wow. Okay. I, I, I remember nothing about shooting the first time around except that I, they have craft services. And craft services, they had the most, the largest shrimp I had ever seen in my life. <laughs> That's what I remember. <laughs> But there you go. I mean, I would remember that too. Uh, that was some of it stick out to me. Um, and then in that scene, though, it Lou's Cafe, and, and I've heard you talk about it before, um, but it's one of those things that I think that anybody who's seen the film, one of the one of the lines that everyone remembers is, is, the, is the inflection, the vocal inflection of delivery of, of mayor, the way that you say it. Um, did, was that just a natural thing, or did you have any, did you put any thought into that, or did that just how it came out? I was more... I, I was thinking more about the physical aspect, about the um, ab ab about the revelation coming over my face more so than I was the the audio portion. The audio portion was just <laughs> it was just organic. It just happened like that. Did you do you think it had anything to do with your your background as, as a vocal actor? You know, you're you're trying to bring these characters to life without using facial features, just using vocal inflection, and maybe that was maybe that training. Is, is what made that line, because it's iconic. It's weird that one word, just the way that it's said, mayor, you wouldn't think that that would stick out so much in the film, but every person who's seen the movie knows mayor. You know, I can't do it justice, but everybody knows that. Do you think that your background in voice acting had anything to do with it? I have to plead the fifth. I have no idea. It just, it just happened, and just like the whole movie, everything just works. <laughs> 
I think that, that I think that's a great way to put it because it, it seemed like everything in this movie just seemed to click. And when you um, I don't know if it was at a premiere, you had a, a, a cast and crew screening. I don't know the first time you saw the film after it was completed before it was released in in July of 85. But when you saw it, is it one of those things to where you knew, hey, man, this actually might be huge. Well, the fact that it was a Steven Spielberg film and it was starring probably one of the most uh, famous television personalities at the time, I I assumed it would be, you know, a decent film. And I, um, go ahead. I I was, uh, I thought my part was too little. (laughs) (laughs) For sure. You know, and I, you know, and, and and Harry got a gold record, so I tease him about that all the time. I could have been I could have been Marvin Berry and had a gold record. <laughs> <laughs> but but instead, your your uh, forever nobility as the mayor of 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 Hill Valley. But it goes to number one. It's the biggest movie of the year. Um, were you thinking? Well, obviously they're going to do another one. Uh, I was not actually. So when when you got I... the call to come in and okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, no, I was just going to say that uh, after the theatrical release and it, you know, did what it was supposed to do. I mean, I was an actor. I was out trying to find other work um, because that was in the can and there wasn't going to be anything else coming from that. So, you know, I went on with my life. And then when you when you get the call that they're, they're all going to do the sequel, I mean, it's several years later, four years later um, is, is when in 89 is when Back to the Future 2 came out. So. Were you um were you ex- when you heard the sequel was going? Were you expecting a phone call? Did you think maybe they can find a way to get Goldie Wilson back in this one? Um, and then when you got the call that you're also going to play uh, your I guess grandson Goldie Wilson the third, what was your what was your thinking then? Well, now that's a cute story. I didn't know that Back to the Future Two was being shot until it was finished. And when it was finished, I was a little upset because they didn't uh, have any. Uh, any Goldie Wilson in part two, but hey, it's universal. I'm just a little actor. Go pound sand, dude. Um, and then I got a call. Don't remember who it was from. Got a call from the studio that uh, wanted to negotiate a deal with me to uh, come and play Goldie Wilson the third, and I declined it um, because they wanted to give me a little bit of money. And I knew at this time that this film had made a bazillion dollars, so money wasn't an issue. So I just said, uh, no, I don't want to do it. And uh, unless you give me this day rate, and they declined the day rate, obviously. Went on about my business, and I guess a day or two later, I got a call. They're like, okay, we'll give you the day rate. And I go, and uh, was it stage 27? I can't remember. One of the stages in Universal, I go in there and they have this huge green screen set up. So I go in there to green screen. They dress me up. I, I do the whole hover conversion thing. And um, that's how it all happened. But because the film was over and all the credits had been done, if you notice, I don't know about now, but you'll notice on the original that my name does not appear in any of the credits of Goldie Wilson III because they had already been done. And to go and redo them obviously would have been a big uh, budgetary issue. So there's a little trivia for you. Wow, I did not know that because uh, you, you just assume that it was all done at the same time, and I didn't know that the film had already been completed. That's something I didn't even know. Um, and and for you though to to be able to still be a part, even even you know just doing the the Goldie Wilson the third thing, um, it, I'm sure it was fun to continue the le- the legacy of that character. And um, and you said you you're doing more acting in between then. How how much do you think? that that character, or, or let me, not how much, why do you think the character of Goldie Wilson resonates so well? Because uh, in the book that I worked on, I list Goldie Wilson as uh, one of the, if not the, most important character outside of, you know, the main four of, of Doc, you know, Marty, Lorraine, and, and, and Biff, and George. Um, why do you think Goldie Wilson made that connection with so many people and why we think about Goldie Wilson every time we think about Back to the Future? Well... My best guess is, uh, after having in 2010, I found out I found out in 2010 that Back to the Future was a, still a big hit. I didn't know. Um, really, you had no idea that people that, still 
like connected to it so much? Didn't have a clue. Wow, really? Did not have a clue. Okay. I saw, I saw a Back to the Future, Back to the Future reunion on the internet uh, out here in Burbank, and uh, it was Chris, it was Michael, Claudia Wells, Jeffrey Wiseman, Bob Gale, uh, and some other people. I saw the picture, and then once again, I got pissed off again because I basically thought. It is Back to the Future dissing me again. <laughs> um, and, and so I decided to do some Googling and, and looking and stuff. And as I began to you know, go through, I Googled my name and I Googled the character's name. And then I came back with pages and pages and pages of stuff. And I had a friend who had been telling me for years, man, the marriage, the marriage, man, yeah, whatever. Um, and then I saw all of that stuff and, and I was like, holy cow. But to answer your question, I think uh, because of the fact that now I've been to so many uh, personal appearances and Comic Cons and I've had a chance to talk to the fans and stuff like that, I, I imagine it's just because of the fact that the character instilled such, along with their familiar part, instilled uh, a, a level in confidence, a level of confidence in people who might have been wavering on the, 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 the less confident side. Um, I've had a lot of conversations about this. People tell me, you know, that really inspired me and stuff. I was like, wow, okay, that's awesome. That's the, that's the best I can do for you, Brad. I, I don't understand the phenomenon. No, I, I think that I, I think that you do. I think you hit it right on the head. It is such a, to me, it is an inspiring thing because I always think about uh, Don, like, I don't know, sometimes I break it down. Like, man, if I never if I never talked to that person, I would have never met this person. I never would have done that. You know, I kind of break it down. And when you think about Goldie Wilson, you know, had Marty just not given him that one small, you know, line, that's right, he's going to be mayor. And and given the character of Goldie something to shoot for, even if it was 30 years from now, he had that in the back of his mind the whole time. That uh, and, and it goes with the film. If you put your mind to it, you can accomplish anything. I think that Goldie Wilson is the perfect example of that. And it was before uh, Marty had, before Marty's changes, George's changes, even Doc's. It was Goldie Wilson that we first knew if you put your mind to it, you can accomplish anything. And I think that's why the character has resonated for all of these years. Now going on the 35th anniversary, if you can believe it or not, of the first film. Wow. Um, crazy. Uh, in, in 2015, when we had the Future Day celebrations, I know that you've done so many great things with the Back to the Future community. What was that like for you, actually, being able to live in Future Day and see that fandom all come rushing back again? We were in... Uh... We were in London, and uh, Ed was surreal. It was just surreal. That's all I can say. Um, there were so many people there, and so many people have such love for the trilogy. I, 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 I continue to be humbled and astounded by the, the staying power of this film. Do you think, um, and it's a, de it's, a, it's a debate with 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 the fan community so much, but do you think that we ever see a continuation of the of the series, or would you like to see another Back to the Future, whether it be a four or a reboot or anything like that, or do you think that these three films they hit it out of the park? There's no reason to touch it. Let it be. I think people want another one simply because the first three was so endearing, but I don't think that another one will capture the essence of what the, the originals did. It's you know. Leave it alone. Let it, let it, let it, uh, let it live in its glory. Don't try and do anything. And it's my understanding that the Bobs have uh, something written into their contracts or whatever that, as long as they're alive or whatever, that no remakes can be made. And and I think that you know it's it's one of those things. It's it's I think as a fan, I would I would be open to another story. But I'm I'm like you. I don't think that you could just capture the the, the magic of those first three, especially the first one, which many people regard as as a perfect movie. Now, um, after the Future Day thing was was awesome for everybody. In 2018, you did a uh, a project called the Fastest DeLorean, World's Fastest DeLorean. Talk talk to me about Fastest DeLorean in the world. Talk to me about that. What was the um what was the inspiration to do the Fastest DeLorean in the world? And well, uh, Claudia Wells invited me over to a, a, a fan event. Um, oh gosh, I forget what year it was, a while back. And uh, the event uh, was, was taking place at a, at a house not too far from where I live. And I get there and the guy that owns the house has a, a DeLorean time machine and a, uh, a mini golf course in his backyard. 
um, Adam Contra. So after meeting Adam, I mean, you know, we just kind of hit it off. We just became buds. And Adam has a distinct uh, pleasure of being the longest running blogger in history. He's been doing a video blog since way before digital stuff was happening. Um, so we became friends and uh, we would just shoot different stuff and uh, the, the transmission or the transmission of the engine in his car blew up or just went out. DeLoreans aren't noted for their awesome drivetrains, by the way. Um, so he decided to put a uh, big engine in it. Corvette engine, I think it was, an L3, LS3 or something like that. And then document it as, uh, as, it, as it happened. So when he put it in there, he decided to go for the world's record. And like I said, Adam documents everything. So every time we went somewhere and did something with the car, he would shoot it and he knitted it all together and came up with a, with a film. That's how that happened. Yeah, and, and, and it's available. People can watch it now. And, and now that we're here at the 35th anniversary, Don, um, what, what, and I know it's a weird time in the world right now, but um, what can we expect from Goldie Wilson? It is an election year. I know that Goldie has been putting his name out there, maybe going to be on the ballot in November. What can we expect from Goldie Wilson in, in the year 2020? Well, it came to my understanding that in 2016, uh, I had a shot at being president because I think I had a, total of about 17 or 18 write-in votes. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a start, so right? Goldie, Goldie, huh? It was a, it's a good start. But that's a great start. You know, that's, that's 18, 18, only, only what? 80 million to go. <laughs> <laughs> um, every, every election Goldie runs, Goldie probably will never win, but it's just to bring some levity and, and fun into what sometimes can be a tense and weird situation. Oh, I think it's fun. Well, De- Goldie's always going to have my vote. And, and um, like I said, it's crazy that we're here at the 35th anniversary. And, and Don, I, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to me because there's so many people out there like me who are fans of these films, who, who hold them near and dear to their hearts. Um, and you have been one of those characters that has been in my life as long as – Here's the thing. You've been in my life as long as my parents have, as far as I'm concerned, or, or any or my oldest friend. I've, I've seen Goldie Wilson my entire life, and it's an absolute honor and privilege to be able to speak to you today, especially now that we're embarking on the 35th anniversary of the films. Um, I ask everybody who's come on to the show this, um, uh, Crispin, Jeffrey, Leah, Harry, er, everybody, I've asked them, and I'll ask you to, to close out here. In your opinion, what makes Back to the Future timeless? Um, story, performance, and visual. Wow. I think that that is a phenomenal answer. <laughs> Goldie Wilson, Don Full of Love, I appreciate you taking the time. Let the people know where they can find you, get in contact with you, follow you, get any merchandise that you may have, and where can they vote in November for Goldie Wilson? There's always a little blank space at the end of every ballot that says right in. <laughs> but you know what? It's fun and games. I want everybody to take their votes seriously, though, know, and, and, and vote for who they really believe can take this country forward. Um, my vote for Goldie is just a novelty thing, and it's fun, like I said. It just brings levity to the situation. But it's very serious to vote, so I just tell everybody, get out there and uh, do your thing to vote. Awesome. And I know you have, you have the website. You can find Don online there. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's um, uh, MayorGoldieBTTF.com. MayorGoldieBTTF.com. You got all gr- kinds of great stuff. You can get campaign pins, uh, a sign, 8 by 10s I know you got the gambit over there, so make sure you go do that for Don. Don, again, I appreciate you taking the time. Mr. Mayor Goldie Wilson, Don Full of Love, thank you so much. Thank you. Sorry it took so long. And she joins me right now. Darlene is on the phone with a Zoom call. We're looking at each other. Darlene, how you doing? I'm doing awesome. How you doing, Brad? I'm good. I'm good. I'm excited to talk to you. You know, long, long time fan, right? Uh, I've been a long time fan, but how, how are you doing out there in beautiful California? Oh, California is beautiful right now. It's, it's a little chilly, but we love it. It's blue skies and I really can't complain. I'm in, you know, a great area of Santa Monica, so I'm doing pretty well. So how Texas, about you? I, you know, I'm good. We're, you know, Texas, it's hot, you know, for 50 weeks a year. So oh, yeah. <laughs> we have two weeks of, of a little cold, so we'll be fine. But uh, but but walk me through what's been what's been going on in your world as of late. 
Well, let's see. Um, well, starting with the pandemic, of course, you know, we were shut down for a few months and now just starting to get back into auditioning, which is just a whole other realm because you don't go into the room anymore. You have to set up a tape and then you could hopefully find a friend to um, help you tape or, um, and then you have to, you know, download it and we transfer it. And then you could spend like hours on this and you don't even know if the casting director will even look at it. So we're in that whole realm right now of auditioning. Um, and you know, with there's a lot of uh, productions that keep getting shut down because of COVID tests and things like that. I have a friend who's doing a movie right now and producing it and he's just like, they're spending a fortune just in COVID tests. I can and, only imagine. Yeah, and then just constantly shutting down for crew or cast or this or that, so you know, we're all in it together. So what else can you, you know, just have to make the best of it, you know? Uh, absolutely. I just, you know, for me, I'm such a person who I need to, I need to vibe with what's going on in the room, right? So I, I can yeah. only imagine trying to do an audition where you can't feel the room and kind of tailor your, uh, tailor your portrayal, you know, based off the feedback you're getting. Yeah, exactly. Because they really only watch like the first three seconds and they know by then if, okay, do we want her? No, move on. They, you know, they might not even watch the rest of it. But um, listen, I've been doing this for 32, three, four years. I don't even know. And, <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and also I'm in a weird age range right now because I am in my fifties and um, usually I play the mom of like, you know, of a daughter that's in trouble or something and now you know the age range for that has gone way down and you know it's just another it's just i have to get older i have to be like in my you know 60s and 70s and 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 look older and you know to get different roles but you know i have kids i have dogs i have a lot going on so um it keeps me pretty busy i'm sure that it does well you know i've i've been perusing your imdb and, and, you know, obviously we're going to talk about your, your work in Back to the Future, uh, both part two and the ride, which I want to talk extensively about. But okay. um, you were on Boy Meets World, which I actually think for my generation, one of the greatest shows of all time, right? That, for, ah. When I was a kid, one of the best shows of all time. I had, uh, I had Mr. Feeney on the show uh, a couple months ago, who was, who was great. Talk to me about your experience on Boy Meets World. Oh, my God. That was so fun. I don't How many episodes did I do? I think I you think. did four. Four. Yeah. And um, everyone was so great. I love the kids on the show. I mean, they were kids to me, you know, mm -hmm. but um, this, because Ben and Fred Savage were always there. And um, and they were they all had this great camaraderie. They were like family. And that was the first time I ever knew they taught me this, that you can chew Trident gum with the wrapper on and it dissolves in your mouth. <laughs> I thought that was like one of my biggest memories of shooting Boy Meets World was chewing Trident gum with the wrapper on. And um, so that, <laughs> but everyone's so great. And, you know, um, such talented kids and just adorable. I mean, you know, it's always fun doing sitcom work because it's so quick and you have a live audience, you get the feedback, you get the laughs, you know. Um, so it was really fun. I loved it. In a normal sitcom, you know, how many days are you there? Because they try to do it throughout the week, right? So you have the table yeah. read, maybe a rehearsal, and then a shoot night. Is that all you're doing? Yeah, it's like five days or something. Like you, and, and normally the script that you started with changes drastically from Monday to Thursday. So you're like, wait, I loved that line, but then they cut it because it didn't work or this or that. So, yeah, you just rehearse. It's a lot of waiting around, a lot. And especially if you're a guest star, you're only in a couple scenes. So you're just sitting there waiting for your scene to come up. So you're always at the craft service table eating. And so that was my favorite part. Anytime I could eat like on set, that's like my favorite part because uh, I hate cooking at home. <laughs> <laughs> you got to get a free meal somewhere. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And all the, you know, the candy and everything. I'm such a candy girl. So um but yeah, but then also, you know, just shoot the breeze with the crew and things like that. But you wait around, you walk around the Warner Brothers, you walk around, the, you know, sound stages and stuff and and uh, wait to go on. And then when they bring in the live audience, you know, you do a whole run through for the producers. And then that night you do like five hours. Uh Oh, it's all um, good. Sorry, someone was calling and I have it on do not disturb. I don't know why that went through. Um, so. 
Yeah, so, um, you know, they do the warm up, but, you know, it can take like five hours to shoot a 30 minute, 24 minute show. Yeah, and, and as a guest star, would you ever, because would you ever try to, I don't know, you see the script and you think, hey, this, it would be cool if I kind of approach it this way, and you try to maybe improv on set, or are they pretty strict of, I need you to follow to the letter? You kind of have to, especially if you're a guest star, you kind of have to follow through. There's certain shows where you, you have to ask, can I change a little thing? Can I do this? Can I do that? Or you ask permission. And there's, I mean, there are some shows, especially nighttime drama shows that you have to say it word for word. You have to ask for everything, you know, especially if you're a guest, um, you know, which is, you know, difficult, but, um, you know, cause you kind of want to like, put your little thing in there too but sometimes they're just very strict so how did how did it all begin for darlene wait where did you start off did did you start off always knowing that you wanted to go into acting or or where did the desire start no i mean what was funny is um you know when i was like 10 or 11 i'd be in the bathroom and like take a bottle of shampoo and conditioner or something like that read the back and pretend i was doing commercials in the mirror you know because i i don't i mean who does that right but I was never in, you know, theater at school. I was never doing any of that. And I actually did a beauty pageant when I was in high school. And um, I actually won it. It was in New Jersey at the time. And that got me a scholarship to an acting school in New York. And I just, why did I do it? I can't remember why I did it. Um, I can't remember why I, I, I went on the beauty pageant. Anyway, but I got a scholarship to an acting school because I took a gap year after high school before I went to college. And in that gap year, I worked and then I, I went to New York three times a week to acting class. And I just had a ball. I didn't know what I was doing. I had no clue, but I just had so much fun. And then um, when I went to New York City, I was going to Fashion Institute of Technology, FIT in New York for marketing and cosmetics and fragrances. That's what I was going to do. And then I ran out of money. I couldn't finish college. Um, And so one of the guys on my floor was like, hey, you want to model? I know an agent. And I was like, sure, I'll do anything. I was spraying perfume on people at Saks and on the weekends. And yeah, then I got with a modeling agent, started doing showroom, you know, modeling, then print work. And and then just started auditioning. You know, my my model agents would send me out on stuff. So one of my first things on a set was for Bright Lights Big City and I played Kiefer Sutherland's Day Inga. I was had a side I was there for to be an extra and um and then um uh, they upgraded me to silent bit. So I made like $140 instead of $99. And uh so yeah it was with Michael and and Kiefer but you know they didn't really talk to us because we were the little people then. <laughs> so yeah, and I just, it just, you know, a manager, Julia Roberts manager saw me on a crystal light commercial and signed me and that's started me on my, I still didn't know what I was doing. I had no clue. I mean, I just kind of rolled with it. Did you ever have a moment? Like I always look for that Eureka moment, you know, where people get, you know, when people will give you advice, give you advice, give you advice, and then it doesn't make any sense to you until that one day you're like, oh, that's what they were saying. Did you have a Eureka moment ever on set where you started to feel like you were getting it? No, (laughs) no, no. I mean, every time that you, you know, I have to say, um, yeah, when I first did my first sitcom, like Charles in Charge, I did. And I, and that's where I met one of my best friends on it because we both were the guest stars. You know, we just, you just listen. I mean, I did, this is stuff that you don't learn in acting school and I took acting school, but you know, I think sitcoms are a great place to learn, you know, because, you know, they tell you where to hit your mark and this and this and that. But I remember this one director wanted me so bad for this pilot. And I was so green, me and greening. I didn't know what I was yeah. doing, but he loved me. He kept bringing me in and in and in. He goes, I know you can do this. And I'm just like, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> but as you work, you know, you just... You just learn more and more, the technical stuff. But acting is all about listening, reacting, saying your line, hitting your mark. I mean, you have to be able to delve into a character. And I don't know how I do it. I mean, there's like some things I know I can't do, I'm not capable of. But, um, but yeah, I mean, every, every single set was definitely a learning, learning curve. Every single one. So... 
when you're you're doing these sets, your your agents are sending you out on auditions. You know, I'm sure some you're knocking out of the park. Some you know you wanted, but maybe it didn't work out. How how do you end up getting into feature work? And and when we're talking about that, it's really you you are spiking back to the future too, um, which at the time in '89, the biggest sequel maybe ever. <laughs> you know, uh, at the time because I know we didn't know. We didn't yeah. know that's what it was, you know, when we were shooting, it was like, wow, this is, this is like going to be really big, you know? And, and I was, that was my first movie. And I had think, I think I'd only done Charles in Charge and a ton of commercials. I mean, I was like a commercial queen. I mean, I did so many commercials. Um, I did a little bit in the Equalizer and, um, yeah, I mean, I walked into my agent's office and they were like, hey, Darlene, how young can you play? And I'm like, I don't know. So he goes, well, go on this audition. And that was for Back to the Future. And so I, I walked in and, and just had a meeting with the casting director and we bullshitted and stuff. And she's, she was like asking me stuff on my resume, which were lies, like my, my, my theater experience. I just wrote down things that were, I had no experience. How are you supposed to have a resume when you have no experience? I mean, right. I, was, I started acting really old, you know? I mean, I wasn't 18 when I started acting. I started in my 20s because I did the modeling mm -hmm. thing in the commercials first. So for me, I was already old starting. Um, in my 20s, you know, 20, I guess I was 24, 25. Um, so uh, yes, I walked in and then didn't hear anything and then came back like a month later and then met Ricky and Jason and we just had to improv in the room and and then we sat around another month and then they said oh you got it it's, it'll be a two-week job and we're like oh, okay cool ended up being two months yeah I, I want to ask about that because obviously you're also involved in, in a lot of elaborate scenes that were shot um, uh, during that time that you were on set but were you aware of Back to the Future prior I mean, obviously you knew the movie, but did you see it? Were you a fan? Did you I don't know remember. Michael J. Fox? I, I honestly do not remember if I saw it. I, I, I really don't. I mean, I don't remember like the enormity of the movie. I just don't remember at all. I just, I, I have to ask Ricky because Ricky's got a better memory than me, but I have to say, did we know that we were on like this blockbuster movie when we were shooting it? I mean, I mean, because I don't know if, did Back to the Future already come out when we shot it? I didn't know. Yeah, okay, wow. So, yeah, I mean, it came out, the sequel came out, what, four years later from the first film. So, um, it, it was definitely. Oh, so then I guess I must have seen it. Yeah. I perhaps, must have seen it. maybe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't. It's, you know, so long ago. I mean, you know, it's funny when you shoot all this stuff. I mean, even the series Pacific Blue that I was on for five mm -hmm. years, I shot 88 episodes on there, and I, I just recently watched it again, and I'm like, I don't remember shooting half this stuff. It's it's crazy, you know? And and sometimes I'll say, like, oh, there's so-and-so. And I'm like, oh, right, I did Northern Exposure with him. I forgot I worked with that guy. You know, you just, I've worked so much on so many different things that you kind of forget after a while, you know, what you've done. It's kind of odd. So when you got your your sides for, for your character in Back to the Future 2, um, do you remember what the description was of this character and what you were supposed oh, to yeah, do? Oh, yeah, just... Yeah, it's spiked, tough. Well, I mean, I got the whole um, realm of the character when I went for a fitting and Joanna Johnston was like fitting me in this whole outfit. And I was like, yeah, this is awesome. I love the outfit. And we were like, oh, let's do this. And we were kind of like talking about it together. And she said, oh, we want to do this and do this. And then my eye um, naturally is half brown and half blue, one of my eyes. So they got the um, idea for my eye to put a different color contact in my eye for Spike. And then I had to go get fitted for that, but it didn't have a little hole in the middle. So I, when they put it in my eye, I just saw red in that eye. Everything was red in that eye. So you couldn't see at all? Could you see through Not it? Not in that eye. I, wow. You could see through it, but it was like a red filter was over my eye. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Okay. And then I had to get my hair bleached. I, you know, they bleached the front bangs of my hair. And, um, and then we had to, you know, go for practice on the hoverboards, you know, with the stump people and stuff. So there was a lot of prep for it. So it was, it was really fun. I mean, still didn't know like really what this is all about. My last two week job. Cool. But I don't remember even telling my friends I'm in back to the future. I mean, you know, too. you know, the sequel, I didn't, I don't remember even telling them that. That's crazy to me. So, okay, you said two weeks, it turned into two months, but you mentioned the hoverboards too. 
How much training did you have to do on those hoverboards? Do you remember? And was it uncomfortable? Because you hadn't done anything, I'm assuming, to that level um, no. where you're hanging from wires or what have you. Yeah. Yeah, no, I've never even been on a skateboard. So, um, <laughs> yeah. So, well, the stunt people took us way out in the, you know, desert area and they had it all set up and, you know, it was pretty cool. I mean, they just put us on wires and it was a new thing for them too. So they really had to work out the kinks and, um, and I think we only did it a couple times. We didn't really do it that much, but you know, we had to have one wire in front of us, one wire behind us. It's all like a balancing act and, um, you know, nothing was going to happen to us you know, as we were flying around because we were harnessed in, so we couldn't fall off. And we put our feet in, the shoes were nailed to the, um, to the skateboards, so to the boards, so hoverboards, I should say. So yeah, it wasn't like, you know, we were going to fall out, fall off of them. So why did it, why was a two week job? Why did it turn into two months? Well, you know, they had that special split uh, camera, you know, mm -hmm. so it could show everybody at a different age and stuff. So I, I thought it was called the Tondra camera. They named it something else in, in, in another interview that I saw. But um, the lighting would had to be, the lighting took for hours because of this special split vision. And um, so sometimes we'd be sitting there for like five hours waiting for them to just light the scene. So the cafe alone took one month and then the hoverboard scene took a month. Yeah. Just to so, light it and get the shot ready? Light it and get the shots done and all the angles and all the split vision and Michael this age and Biff that age. And, you know, it's a lot of work. You know, that was a lot. And it was new to them. They didn't know, you know, it was a new technique they were doing. So it was pretty cool. But there was a, it was a lot of sitting around for Ricky and Jason and I. So we got to know each other very well. And Ricky and I are very close. We're still very close. So it's great. Yeah, now Jason's out there, you know, being the villain in Mulan and all kinds of stuff, right? Yeah, so. Yeah, yeah. yeah pretty I know, cool. I hadn't seen Jason since the premiere, um, since the reunion, uh, the 30th, no, 25th reunion. I think that's where I saw him. Yeah, yeah, because I hadn't seen him in so long. Because he had, was living in Hawaii, then he was living in Singapore, so now he's back, yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. So was it was it kind of like Groundhog's Day having to go to the set for a month in the cafe 80s and and were you doing the scene multiple times or you was it waiting on lighting and stuff yeah we did we did the scene a few times you know um the the famous my famous one line what's wrong with fly you got no throat i remember the first time i did that and i don't know if you've heard me say this before but um uh you know i was doing my thing and then i grabbed michael by the groin and he had a big ketchup bottle in his pants <laughs> And I, and I didn't know what to do. I was like, do I break character or not? Because it's my first gig, you know, I don't want to like mess up, you know, but um, it was funny. So um, we were all laughing and I was like, oh yeah, you wish Michael. <laughs> 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 and every, he was laughing, but um, he just wanted to break the ice. That's how kind he is. He's just the kindest person on the planet. And um, so, yeah, and then we did it. Yeah, we did it a few times and uh, you know, then we had to, do the choreography of all of us going down it, you know, when he was swinging the bat, we all go down and then we all fall on each other. And, you know, and then we come in on that car. So yeah, I mean, we would work sometimes like maybe a few hours a day, but most of the time we were sitting around. So, so talk to me about working though with Tom Wilson, you know, who plays Biff and Griff in those scenes. And I think that he is just a phenomenal actor his nuances between the characters. I just think that he did a great job. What was your experience like working with him? He did a great job. Oh, he was amazing. I mean, Tom was just very giving and very fun. And yeah, you're right. He is very, you know, he's a comedian. So he was very funny. And um, just, I, you know, we just all had such a great experience because we knew that at, at some point that, you know, this is going to be huge and, and it's, we're making history here, you know, and he just, you know, I don't know. I mean, he was such a professional. He had so many scenes. So I didn't get to hang out with him as much until like the hoverboard stuff too. But I remember us all singing songs when we're just waiting there and, and just, I don't know. I mean, just hanging out. I used to hang out with all the extras and talk to them and talk to the crew. And yeah, it was, it was just fun. 
And then do you remember any like specific, I don't know, direction or anything from Robert Zemeckis that stuck with you going on? Every, every time I talk to somebody, and I know you, you had a, uh, a limited uh, speaking role, right? Yeah. But did, were, were you given anything by him or did you observe anything that he did that you just thought, oh, wow, this is why this guy is where he is? Um, he didn't really give us that much direction as far as I remember. I just always remember him cocking his head like this. You know, he always cocked his head with a smile. And he, again, was the nicest guy on the planet. I mean, just so, so nice, so calm, never yelled. I mean, just, he was just, you know, he always was laughing, just having a good time. Um, I just think his professionalism is, you know, that's where, that's why he does so well. And his, he's got such a creative mind. I mean, but look at, you know, look at the script he's working with that Bob Gale came up with. I mean, that's brilliant. I mean, I just don't, I could never be a director. I mean, I just don't have that vision, you know, reading a script going, wow, you know, yeah, I could see that. I mean, there's just so many special effects in this movie. I just don't know how they pulled it all off. Yeah, but they did. They did pull it off. Movie comes out, you know, massive success automatically. What did you, did, what was your, um, I don't know, what, what did you feel after the movie came out? Did you feel like, wow, I, I was really a part of something? And did you think maybe, okay, this, I'm going to do all of these movies now. What, you, what were you thinking when the movie came well, out? Well, I mean, the third one was back-to-back -back with Ricky. Right. I mean, he's the only one that did the back-to-back -back movie. But, um, uh, no, I mean, I just went on. I went on to doing TV shows and TV pilots and ski school. <laughs> I mean, it's so funny because, you know, here I work on this big blockbuster movie. And what was really funny is that I would go, I remember going to the premiere and a lot of people didn't recognize me. So they're like, I'm like, it's Spike, you know, because my hair was different and I, I had the Spike. You know, a lot of people didn't see me without my costume because as soon as we got to set, we got into costume. So they never really saw me natural. Um, so they were like, Spike, that's you? And I'm like, yeah, it's me, because at the premiere, they just didn't know. And um, so, yeah, I mean, after that, yeah, was the next movie was Ski School. It's like a low budget, you know, thing shot in Canada. And I'm like, we were treated like queens on Back to the Future with the craft service of <laughs> steak and lobster and amazing food. And Ski School's like pasta and plastic forks. <laughs> <laughs> Reality check, right? <laughs> yeah, I was like, wow. You know, it was kind of like me going from Pacific Blue with my own trailer to a soap opera where you're sharing a dressing room and there's no craft service. I'm like, where's the bottled water? Where's where's craft service, you know? <laughs> I mean, I've done everything as far as acting. I mean, it's just with the commercials and extra and silent bit and guest stars and B movies and blockbuster movie. And, you know, it's just, it's a great, great learning you know, experience. I'm glad, like, I don't know how people, when they go from here to here right away, they must get like a big head. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then, cause I have worked with a lot of actors that demand so much and you, I'm just like, geez. I mean, I was never like that. I was always just thankful to have a job, you know? I mean, always. And when you work with people that are just so demanding and, you know, don't show up on time or, you know, make people wait or, you know, complain about everything or demand facials and things. And I'm just like, oh, that's what gives actors a bad name when you have those kind of divas. Right, right. Well, you know, they're, they're in every industry, but maybe a, a little bit more yeah, prominent that's true. In, in, in Hollywood at times. Um, but how did, how did the ride come about? Because for the longest oh. time, I had no idea that you were the same, you know, that you were both. Right, yeah. I had no idea because, like you said, you look so different as Spike than you yeah. do. You look like yourself in the Back to the Future the Ride film. So, how did all that come about? Joanna Johnson, the wardrobe um, a lady from Back to the Future, she has suggested me for the role. So she says, "Why don't you just use Darlene?" And they're like, "Oh, okay, cool." So um, yeah, she fitted me, outfitted me for that too, to be a futuristic, like you know. Uh, airline stewardess, journalist, whatever I was, uh, commentator. <laughs> yeah. And it was funny because, you know, Christopher Lloyd had just shot his stuff right before mine. And then the teleprompter broke for me. And I had pages of copy. And I'm just like, oh my God, I didn't memorize all this stuff because I knew it was teleprompter. So I just had it right next to me. And since I was like a 
journalist type of thing or host, you know, I had it right in front of me. So I would be like, and they just shoot it in little clips. So that was fun. I remember going to the premiere of the ride and Michael Jackson was there and, and that was pretty cool to go on that. And really, but, but people still didn't recognize me. I mean, my people that knew me recognized me, but I remember being on the ride and being in the elevator and I was coming up on the screen and, and people didn't realize I was the same person, like on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. Michael Jackson was at the, uh, the debut of the ride. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah, at Universal. Yeah. What was it like to be in his presence? Oh, well, they skirt him away. Well, I know, yeah. Him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah it must have been still pretty cool. That's the only person I remember. I, I got to bring two guests, but, you know, I wasn't considered, you know, top-notch for the ride. What did you think <laughs> of the ride, though, itself? Oh, I thought it was a blast. I thought it was a shame that they took it down. I mean, I feel like Back to the Future. I mean, I for the first 25 years, I never did any interviews for Back to the Future. None. Really? It's not until the last five years that all of a sudden we're getting all these interviews and, and signings. And I went to France last year and, and, you know, they want us to go all over the place for these conventions and stuff. And I'm like, and every, even my friends are going, what is up with back to the future? I mean, it was 30 years ago. I said, it is, I don't know. I said, the greatest thing about it, that the fans are getting younger and younger and younger. So you can tell that the, it's still relevant. I mean, the movie is still relevant people love this movie and and you could tell in the fans they're always like oh my god you know i've been you know i saw you when i was just a little kid and you made my life and all this stuff and i'm like oh thank you you know it's just such a great feeling did you um um since you know the movies obviously i think that you're right they were popular when they came out they're even more popular today the back to the yeah. future is more popular now than it ever has been perhaps um and you mentioned that you have kids do your, did you show the movies to your kids at a, or your, the Back to the Future 2 at a specific time? Are they interested or they, is that just mom? That's just mom they doing mom stuff. They are not interested at all. I mean, really? they are more excited when a commercial comes on during like the Today Show. They're like, or if it just automatically comes on and they just happen to be watching TV and like say, I remember once, um, you know, Full House came on and they're like, mom. You're, here you are. And, you know, a lot of my friends didn't even know I was on Full House or, or stuff like that. And it's just like, oh, my God, because they wouldn't recognize me from Back to the Future, like friends. But, um, but uh, yeah, I mean, they've seen it, but they don't think they don't think it's a big deal at all. It's crazy to me. <laughs> yeah, they don't. Yeah, they really don't. I mean, they're like, eh, whatever. Something mom did a long time ago. I don't know why people are still talking about it. Yeah. Yeah. They roll their eyes. And I jokingly say to my daughter, I said, well, you know, I have to do another interview today, you know, because I am a celebrity. And she's like, no, you're not. No, you're not. I'm like, well, not really. But, you know, to some people I am. Right. Well, to me, to me, you are. And speaking of the future, Darlene, what does the future hold for you? Do you have any anything more that you want to accomplish? You said you've done uh, the, the silent bits to the extras, to the sitcoms, to the guest stars, to the blockbusters, anything else on the agenda that you would like to accomplish? Uh, well, now that, you know, my kids are older, I'm able to audition for, you know, and hopefully get another, I would love to be on another series, you know, maybe a little bit down the road. Um, you know, that's, it's just so much fun. And I love working. I don't like, you know, when you're a guest star or whatever, you're just sitting around a lot and you're kind of treated like a glorified extra. So I love being more like a series regular because, um, you just get, you know, the respect level you get and just the work and, and it's just, it's fun for me, you know? Um, but I don't want to be on the top of the call sheet because then you're working all the time. I'd rather be on the lower end. So like, I'm like maybe recurring. Cause like when I was on Pacific blue, I was there at, you know, five 30 in the morning until sometimes midnight. And it's a long, you know, never see anybody. So I couldn't do that, you know? But if it was only a couple days a week, I would mind it. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds ideal, doesn't it? It sounds there's ideal. There's some shows, yeah. There's some shows that I watch that I'm like, oh my god, I'd love to be on that show. I'd love to be on that show. But, um, but yeah, yeah. But you we know, we'll see. see. You don't know. That's that, that's the beauty about this business. You have no idea. I mean, like I always say, Michael J. Fox was selling his last piece of furniture when he got family ties. And so that's the beauty of this business. You could like say, I'm done. I quit. 
it's over. And then all of a sudden an audition comes up and you get it. And it just, you know, you, you just, you know, get back on again. It changes everything. You never know what the future will hold, but we appreciate you talking with us today about Back to the Future and everything that you've done. It's been an absolute pleasure to speak with you. Would you like to, you. to let the people know where they can find you and follow you? Yeah, I have an Instagram page, Darlene Vogel. I haven't done a web page yet. Um, I just, haven't gotten around to I think I'm too old for all that stuff but <laughs> yeah I'm on Instagram and I usually post a lot of back to the future stuff on there so you can just follow me on Darlene Vogel I don't really go on Twitter that much so I, you know it's a little bit too much for me so Instagram is pretty much my favorite Instagram's a place well Darlene we appreciate you joining but I us today I want to say thank you to all the fans for following us you know it's just really a joy to um to make everybody happy Absolutely. And we, you'll continue that we just celebrated the 35th anniversary and the 30th anniversary, I think, of Back to the Future 2 last year. And I'm sure there'll be many, many more down the road. Oh, hey there. Yes. There you are. We froze. Oh, no. Okay. Well, I was just saying, you know, I really appreciate, I really appreciate you joining us today. And I'm sure that we'll uh, be celebrating Back to the Future for the decades to come. Yes, I hope so. And when I'm 90 years old, I'll be, you know, walking around my hoverboard. <laughs> <laughs> we, we would be so lucky. Darlene, thank you again. Thanks, Brad. And he, and he joins me right now. You might recognize him from Saturday Night Live, or I first saw this man on Wild and Out back in the day. He is, back in the day. He is Mikey <laughs> Day. Mikey, how you doing, man? Thanks for having me, Brad. I'm so excited. Yeah, man, we're going to talk about Back to the Future. You know, I, I put it out on Twitter. I said, yo, who, yeah. who are some big Back to the Future fans out there? And your name came yeah. up. A lot of people suggested you. So talk to me. Like, what? It, why, is Back to the Future the, your favorite film of all time? Absolutely. And thank you to the Twitter sphere for hooking us up here. Um, yeah, absolutely. I saw it when I was, I believe, six years old. And I saw it. My mom took me to see it. This is how crazy I'm dating myself and um, how crazy movies were back then. I saw it. I think my mom took me to see it in January and it came out in the summer of 85. And I saw it in January of 86 and it was still in the movie theaters. That's how crazy it was. <laughs> wow. And man. then I, <clears throat> yeah. And then I rented it ad nauseum and then when the second and third one came out, I was like, like 10, nine or 10. So I saw those in the theater and then it just began a lifelong ob obsession. I've wanted to buy a DeLorean forever. Not, not necessarily the souped up time machine replica version. I just, I'm obsessed with getting a DeLorean and I just haven't pulled the trigger yet, but I want one so bad. Plus in New York, it's, I'm like, do I want to pay $600 a month to park this thing? <laughs> <laughs> and never get to drive it? And never get to drive it. And it, it also, because I have an eight-year-old son, I'm like, taking him to soccer games isn't going to work. It's a two-seater. So <laughs> imagine my wife would be like, you bought a DeLorean because we don't have a car right now. We just... um. You bought a DeLorean as the family car. This is so not accommodating of a family lifestyle, but um, yeah. And I feel like I've tried to devour any bit of behind the scenes information about the movie. I'm just, I just have an endless fascination for it. It's just, you know, by far the greatest movie I've ever seen and recently showed my son all three during the summer during like lockdown and everything when going out wasn't there was nothing really to do so we showed him all three and he got into it it was great yeah man. we have a little uh, kids book a back to the future kids book that I read him and he was into it but I think when we showed him the movie he was old enough to like really truly appreciate it like because I kept selling it to him like imagine going back in time to when daddy was your age and being able to hang out with mommy and daddy. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. It, it, and and what's, what, what you just hit on is it's such a generational film. 
And it doesn't matter what stage you are in your life, you find a new thing to relate to it, right? There's something that you can relate back to yourself at that moment. Whether when you're a kid, I think the fascination is the time travel aspect oh, of it. Not so much yeah. like going to the 50s, but just being able to time travel. <laughs> and then as you yeah. get older, you're thinking, man, if I could go back, or what were my parents like at my age? You start finding these new things to connect to it. Yeah, it's endlessly, endlessly fascinating. And just small little things that you see every time you rewatch it. And it's also interesting to think about it if it was, obviously it shouldn't be remade, but like, it just makes you feel old. You're like, oh, if they went back now, it would be like, um, I would be, I guess if they went back now in 2020, it would be what, 1990, which is insane. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God. Um, I would be like, when I first saw it, the fifties to me seemed like, oh my God, that's another world. Like that's so far removed. And now, um, I'm to the point where if they went back, it would be 1990, my childhood. So <laughs> it's a little odd to think about, but <clears throat> like just everything about it is, is perfect. Um, and I've, I'm trying to think if I've written any SNL sketches necessarily about that. I did, oh, I wrote, I wrote on Robot Chicken for a while, uh, an adult swim show. And they use like stop motion um, action figures and as puppets. And they do a lot of like pop culture stuff. So they've, they've done Back to the Future stuff. And I wrote, I tried to write one. This is such a weird deep cut, but it was, um, <clears throat> it was just like a shot of Doc's answering machine. And it's just, it's just the Libyans calling him being like, hey, um, this bomb is, it looks like pinball machine. I don't know. Like maybe we're doing something wrong. Anyway, give us a call back and then beep. Hey, it's us again, but it was such a weird, deep cut, like, oh, the Doc's answering machine that the Libyans keep calling, but um, I'm trying to think of anything else maybe in SNL that I've tried to, to get in Back to the Future references. Didn't y'all do something about your future self or something like that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We did my future self, like looking in the mirror, like – it was kind of based on those milk commercials where it was like, Hey, keep drinking milk and you'll be strong. And then he sees himself as a teen and then an adult. So I saw myself as an adult and I had a weird girlfriend. <laughs> I think it was Sandra O oh played. Yeah. Played her. And I'm like, what, who is that? And why am I dating her? Because she seems insane. <laughs> She's drinking a four loco at noon. Um, <clears throat> yeah. But it, Sometime, hopefully, we'll do a, a Back to the Future, some sort of sketch. I know before I got there, they had done the, like, 30th anniversary uh, auditions. Like, Pete, the SNL often does those audition pre-tapes where it just shows a bunch of people do celebrity impressions auditioning for the film. But I remember on the 30th anniversary, I saw the movie at the Twin Pines Mall where they shot it. Oh, man, um, talk about that. How cool that was, was that? Awesome. A feeling? Yeah. It was, and I think they did it, it was in October, so it was, I think it was the day they, Marty goes back, or or maybe that was November, but it it was definitely a, a date important in the movie that they screened it, and they had the DeLorean outside, and Claudia Wells talked before the movie, and it was just cool being in the parking lot. And then people were just rolling around in DeLoreans. <laughs> like, if you have a DeLorean, you're going to that. Just to hang out. And so my buddy and I, like, reenact, you know, on our iPhones, you know, shot me rolling down that little hill that Marty rolls down <laughs> and watching. Made our own little films, just totally geeked out. And then I saw I saw on Twitter or it was on YouTube or something, but 
someone just parked like a replica of uh, Doc's um, big white truck just in the parking lot, and it was just there. <laughs> I'm like, that's awesome. I wish I was uh, back in California to go see it, but I don't know when that was, but I love that it was just kind of there. Like, I don't know what it was part of, but someone just took video. They're like, there, there, there's Doc's van in the literal place it was parked in the movie. So let me ask you this. We, you know, you said that you've watched all three, obviously, countless times. And this is something I like to yeah. ask everybody. You brought up Claudia Wells. Which mm -hmm. Jennifer are you more a fan of? OG oh, Claudia man. Wells or are you like <laughs> Elizabeth Shue in two and three? Elizabeth Shue is great. But I really Elizabeth identify her great. with with uh, Karate Kid, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. To me, yeah. Claudia Wells is the OG Jennifer, and she's the one that I go with. And maybe no more beautiful 1980s girlfriend of all time than Claudia than Jennifer Wells. Jennifer Parker. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I think I agree with you there. I mean, obviously, Elizabeth Shue was awesome and, you know, just as beautiful and stuff. But there's something about the original film that you just kind of – that's Jennifer and it's a I think she was something with her mom or something and she mm -hmm. couldn't do it or that would which is a bummer but um I feel like Elizabeth Shue did fantastic and it's so funny how they're like they always say like we didn't think there'd be a sequel we just put her in the car <laughs> it is really funny how they just leave her out there I'm always like Ooh, is that the best idea? <laughs> yeah, let's just knock her out and leave her in an alleyway. <laughs> yeah, that part of the plan seems very suspect. Um, yeah, I, I'll probably go with original OG Claudia Wells as Jennifer. Hey, stranger. <laughs> um, and I remember being a kid being like, that is the pinnacle of, of beauty. Like... Um, it made, uh, she made such an impression on me. So it, it, it's hard not to see anyone but her as Jennifer. But not to knock Elizabeth Shue, she did fantastic. I'm old! <clears throat> <laughs> I'm old! Yeah. Um, but yeah, that was a long-winded way of saying Claudia Wells. <laughs> Claudia Wells, for sure. Now, you say you, you've rewatched it a lot and picked up on things mm -hmm. that maybe you didn't see before. What are some of those things that Mikey Day has picked up on <laughs> in countless rewatches? Oh, man. Probably nothing that hasn't been pointed out a million times. But it, it is interesting to watch, to, like, see the deleted scenes and then picture them there. Like, what's so funny with the whole uh, chloroform thing that – they cut that he, which is crazy that he chloroforms his dad, <laughs> but that when you see him next and he just goes, you weren't, you weren't at school. What's going on? And he's like, I overslept. You just buy it. And then, but knowing that he was chloroformed, but it still works. It's, a lot of that stuff is, is super interesting. I don't know if I've picked up anything that like you or obviously people listening to this wouldn't know. But I just kind of, um, it's just interesting to look at like little things in the set and stuff that um, you haven't really noticed and just, just weird little details and stuff like that. I always think that woman who, after he shows up in the 50s and the first one, after he sees Lion Estates is all gone and he goes up to that car and that lady's like, don't stop. <laughs> I know. So extreme. Um, yeah, and just like, because I lived in LA for a long time before mm -hmm. um, moving out here, and um, that in 2015 was that Future Day official Future Day. Yeah, the day October 21st, yeah. 2015. Mm -hmm. There was stuff in Burbank at the Burger King where the exterior of Doc's lab in 1985 was shot. So I went, um, I was weirdly there getting my son something at Toys R Us in the Valley and all these people were out and I was like, oh, they're here for future day. So I, but it's interesting to see like the layout of the street and everything and where the actual set was. It's just fun to look at the geography and 
Um, I feel bad for the people who own the Marty McFly house because there's, I feel like there's so many YouTube videos of people like doing this outside the house. But it's still like the, whatever those electrical towers are still there. It's like right. still very much the Marty McFly house. Like they didn't change the, the, they didn't like tear it down and build some like modern new. It just, it's very much the Marty McFly house. Did you ever go by the, uh, the Gamble House, which is the Doc Brown 55 mansion in Pasadena. Did you ever pass by that? No, I have never been there. I would drive by that church on Franklin where they shot the, um, whatchamacallit, uh, all the Enchantment Under the Sea stuff. Oh, and that reminds me, in high school, I was on ASB, which is like the student government at my high school, and our... <laughs> We made our homecoming theme my junior year, Back to the Future, just just so we could have an Enchantment Under the Sea dance. <laughs> <laughs> so wait, you had the actual Enchantment Under the Sea dance? <clears throat> yeah, we had an Enchantment Under the Sea dance. That's awesome. And, and it's, it was just so funny because normally homecoming themes are like A Night Under the Stars or Elegance or something, and ours was Back to the Future, but we had like – this whole homecoming skit at the game because the whole it was it was a big deal like announcing the homecoming queen so i i was doc and my buddy was marty and we came out in a delorean and like during the halftime show at the at the football game the homecoming game and we came out and we went we've been to the future we know who the homecoming queen is <laughs> and talking about it was super cheesy but it was just so much fun to to have it be back to the future. And we had like, during the homecoming assembly, like we had the freshman class president dress up as the clock tower lady. She was going up to people going, save the clock tower. <laughs> so we were such dorks that we made it our homecoming theme, but it was pretty cool. And we had, we had a DeLorean and stuff, um, which they're just cool cars. Like when you see one in person, like you just have a response to it. No, absolutely. Um, the um, you know, I'm here in Houston, and the headquarters, the national headquarters for DeLorean is actually randomly here in Houston, Texas. So I oh, went really? out to the DeLorean headquarters. They had the time oh. machine in the in the uh, you know uh, lobby like way. Lobby? So of I got course. to sit in it, do the time circuits on, made all the noises. <laughs> yeah, it was oh, it was that's awesome. Awesome. Yeah, it was oh, pretty cool. Incredible. They're not like the greatest car in the world to drive, right? <laughs> but right. they're pretty cool, man. And, Have you um, driven one? I got to drive one when I was there, right? And then when oh, I went to cool. go back to take some publicity shots for my book, you know, I yeah. again got to drive one around a little bit. And they're they're fun. You definitely feel like Marty McFly when you're in it, but it's not like it's like <laughs> a, it's kind of like a go kart. It feels what it kind of what it feels. Yeah. Like. Does it not have power steering? I heard the steering yeah, a, is like it's a rough, difficult. Yeah, it's a rough, it's a rough drive. It's a rough drive, oh. but you know, it, it is what it is. I don't know if you ever, um, obviously Alec Baldwin's on Saturday Night Live a lot, and he played John DeLorean. Yeah, he played John DeLorean. Did you yeah. talk to him about that at all? I never really talked to him about it, but I really, I, I want to. Like when I see him, I keep. Usually, when I see him, it's in the, um, it's on Saturdays, and everything's like you know he's getting made up as Trump and stuff, and. I'll talk to him a little bit, but I keep forgetting to bring up that he played DeLorean. I need to talk to him about that. Be like, did you get any cool DeLorean insights or um, any stuff that would be interesting? As a Back to the Future dork, that would be cool. <laughs> that would be cool to for me to you to talk to about. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's actually funny is I was watching Saturday Night Live last Saturday, obviously. And um, nice. you were in the you were in the opening sketch, the cold open for the uh, yeah, the, the, the debates, hall. the town hall debates, yeah. and you and you got to play George Stephanopoulos. And yeah. as Jim Carrey was doing his Biden with the white hair <laughs> and kind of the big motions, I did yeah. have that thought of if they ever did Back to the Future again, there's Doc Brown, Jim Carrey could oh, be Doc yeah. Brown. Jim Carrey is Doc Brown. That's so that would be great, and. I feel like in the modern one, um, who did I think? You have it be a girl in Zendaya. I was like, Zendaya would be a cool Marty. She would be um, a cool Marty. Right? Going back, like, what's going on? Um, yeah, it's crazy to think about um, if they redid it. 
it would so, be so like i hate it but i'm interested <laughs> <laughs> well my thing is like and i've talked about it a lot it's like the the when they redid ghostbusters with the all female right. cast is i was a little hesitant at first but then i was thinking man if it's good that's just more right. ghostbusters and if it's yeah, bad absolutely. it doesn't take away from the quality of the first two to me so why in the hell not give it a shot and um, yeah there's a, there's this a book called the back to the future um uh, ultimate visual history i don't know if you've seen oh it, it's a right yeah i've seen coffee it, table book. yeah yeah it, it's, it's definitely one to pick up but they have a cast list of everyone they called in for uh the parts oh and really one of them for doc was eddie murphy back in 85 they called eddie murphy in for doc and I'm I thinking, did not know that. Yeah, but I'm thinking now, Eddie Murphy now would probably be a killer doc as well. <laughs> oh, my God. Eddie Murphy would be amazing. That's so funny. I had no idea they called in Eddie Murphy. That's crazy. And that must have been I – mean, was he still on SNL in 85? Or was he 80? Yeah. 84, <clears throat> 85? He yeah, might have been. He, yeah. I, he might have been gone by that point. I think he was like 80 because I know after – they did those first five years, and then Lauren was gone for like five years. So it was in between 80 and 85. It might have been like 84, 83. But yeah, that would have been like peak when Eddie Murphy was like beginning um, his rise in movies and like being the biggest star ever. But also Man, a completely he, he different been movie. Great. But a completely different movie. <laughs> it's like Axel Foley. So he would have to have been the – the, the star, really, right? I mean, it wouldn't have been much about Marty as it would have been about Doc. Yeah, it would have been a Doc origin story. <laughs> You'd <laughs> see him again, making I'd it. like to see. I would like to see. Oh, my God. Where do you rank Absolutely. the three? How do you rank your three? Because when I was a kid, for some right. reason, three was my favorite. Three? That's what – when my son saw it, he said three was his favorite. I'm like, what? Kids love three. Yeah. Um, maybe it's the train and stuff. Cause it's, it's not like he's, uh, yeah, because it's not like he's a big, like, he was never into, like, cowboys, like, that wasn't, I mean, he's not opposed to Western stuff, but he was never into, like, the Western thing, so I was, so, I was always so interested, like, oh, kids dig three. I, I go one the best, then two, then three. Um, they're obviously all great, but. There's just something about that, that first one you just can't, you can't redo. And it was just so, so insane yet, um, so simple. You know what I mean? With that first one, I mean, the second one, obviously they had to heighten it, and it, and it's awesome. And I feel like a lot of, there's so much famous stuff, especially from the second one, but the first one is can't be beat in my opinion i mean it's hard to follow up that must have been incredibly difficult to sit down and be like okay the sequel <laughs> where are they going to help with the kids i was always like why are you going now like it's in the future like you could go tomorrow it's okay right <laughs> yeah you don't have to leave right this second but what's funny yeah. about two <clears throat> no go ahead no i was always worried when he leaves that night when he goes um look me up when you get there and then he backs out and then he and then you see the light i was always concerned that he didn't like he didn't know what would be happening in the future at that exact spot like what if there was another car and he hit it i i thought his planning in um going into the future was a little like he should have gone somewhere more remote like that's what i worried about as a kid for some reason <laughs> my in my weird brain yeah well, anyway, you don't want to bump into something for a tangent yeah yeah exactly well what i was going to say about two like i agree with you now mine it goes one two three sometimes it's one three two but mainly it's one two three is how i put them in order but what yeah. i've been telling people is that second one really has the most iconic uh items from it i mean you have a hoverboard behind you yeah, i remember the hoverboard. On, on future day of 20 uh, october 21st 2015 these came out oh my out. gosh you the, have that the pepsi perfect oh my God. yeah i had to make That's... sure that i got one of these um but you would have. <laughs> <laughs> well 
Cafe eighties. Cafe eighties, of course. Uh, you know, Reagan and Michael were the were the yeah, waiters. Ca 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 cafe eighties. <laughs> but um, but you think about that. So hoverboard, the flying DeLorean, the almanac. Uh, the Pepsi yep. Perfect. There's so many things that are so iconic from that second one. You have the hoverboard. Yeah. What else? What else do you have in your Back to the Future collection, or is that pretty much it? I want so much, but I'm like, uh, do I? Should I spend four hundred dollars on a lifelike Marty McFly Hot Toys toy? <laughs> <laughs> and, um my wife's reaction like my wife loves back to the future like our first probably official date was going to the twin pines mall screening of it that i mentioned but so she's obsessed with it as well but i she'd be like what are you how much did you spend uh just a few bucks i have i have a lego um delorean uh that i built and a playmobil delorean that i just that i just got that under the guise of that it's for my son. Cause I've, there weren't, I don't think there were any toys when the first one came out. Um, they just didn't make toys for it. There wasn't a, they might have later on, or maybe there were, and I didn't have access to it, but I remember wanting a DeLorean, a toy DeLorean more than anything. And they weren't around. There wasn't like an official, cause a lot of those movies that came out, around then they always had like the like robin hood prince of thieves had like so so many toys associated with it but back to the future like toys they didn't have a lot of merchandise um but i so i have some deloreans i have the out of time license plate classic um i got uh a little delorean little sterling silver delorean for my lady for christmas one year and um I think that's it. I've almost, Colin Jost at SNL has, and I think it was a prop for that Back to the Future sketch, but he has a flux capacitor that you could, I, I think you could buy them for a while, a little prop flux capacitor. So I really want, I really want to steal it from his office. <laughs> Is, is, is he the other guy on Saturday Night Live who's the biggest Back to the Future fan? I mean, do y'all find yourselves in conversations? <laughs> Just me and Colin talking yeah. about it. I, I love just talking about this with you, though. I feel like anyone, a lot of people, if I would talk about Back to the Future this long with, they'd be like, okay, cool, man. Uh, I got to go. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm sure Colin's a big fan. I mean, he wrote that, uh, that sketch, but I don't know how, if we've ever, like, sat down and really hashed out back to the future stuff but i'm sure he's a fan if he's going to keep the flux capacitor he's definitely a fan of it um but what's cool about that movie it feels like everyone like loves it but i definitely feel like like i will talk about it whenever and it feels like i can't find enough like information about it like have you seen that screen test or i I don't know if it's a screen test, but it's like early footage with Thomas F. Wilson and um, Crispin Glover. Yeah. And they're like, and he's like, what is that, you Irish, whoa, McFly, what is it, an Irish bug? Like he was just ad-libbing and that line, I think came from that moment when he was just messing around and ad-libbing. Like I found that a while ago and was like, oh my God, this is amazing. Tom Wilson but to I me wish... doesn't get enough credit for how phenomenal he is in all three of those movies. Because I counted it up. Incredible. He plays like seven different variations <laughs> of Biff and his relatives. He plays seven. And they're oh. all 100% believable. There's like even even Buford Mad Dog Tannen. You you don't even see Tom oh, yeah. Wilson in it. You know what I mean? Like I remember in, in Hook, I never knew that was Dustin Hoffman who was Captain Hook for the longest time. Oh, really? <laughs> and then even as a kid, I didn't realize that, that Tom Wilson was – Mad Dog Tannen. I thought that was he Mad Dog found Tannen. Some guy who looked like him to play a relative because he does That's such a great so... job. Yeah, he's truly phenomenal in those movies. What's your name, dude? <laughs> Mad Dog Tannen is fantastic, and he just does such an incredible job about making you hate this person. Like probably the best punch in cinematic history in the first one when George lays out Biff. But 
you just there the joy you get in seeing that dude get punched in the face he does such a good job and he does play i can't believe he plays seven different bits <laughs> yeah yeah i mean there's biff that we meet in the in, in the beginning of the movie then 55 biff Five. and then like yep. subservient old. biff it, oh, oh hi marty yeah, <laughs> yes. guy, yeah 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 and then then old biff griff biff. tannon and then uh biff horrific in the alternate 1985. So yeah, yeah. seven seven different biffs throughout the Back to the Future franchise. Just crazy, man. Um, I, I, oh I have a couple God. more things I want to ask you before yeah. I get you out of here because I don't want to keep you all day. Um, so I feel like someone who's watched the movie as many times as you have and, and are mm -hmm. obsessed with it as I am, you, you pick up on small characters who make you laugh or, or who really stick out to you you mean you mentioned the woman and her husband in the car when they're driving by <laughs> to me i mean yep. obviously goldie wilson comes to the mind mayor everyone Ooh. thinks of that mayor as... yep perfect <laughs> um but who who are some side characters that stick out to you from the back to the future universe i mean wallet guy i think he <laughs> took his wallet that guy is incredible i don't i'm so I've heard nothing about it, but I'm so interested. It feels like, to me, he had one line, and like Robert Zemeckis was like, "Dude, this dude is funny. I don't know what it is. Let's make him say it a couple more times." I think he took his wallet. Um, that guy's amazing. Wallet guy's incredible. Um, I got a pit bull now. <laughs> <laughs> that girl is great. Um, I'm trying to think. I love um, Lorraine's family in the first one too. Who the oh, hell yeah. is John F. Kennedy? My um, favorite. My favorite quote in the entire movie is in that scene where you know Lorraine grabs Marty by the thigh. He gets up and leaves, and then her mm -hmm. gran his grandfather, her dad, says he's an idiot. Comes from upbringing. His parents are probably yeah, idiots parents too. Probably idiots too. <laughs> it's my favorite line in all the movies. Just a if great date, If you ever date a guy, you date a guy who acts that way, I'll disown you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no one has two television sets. Yeah, what? now it's funny. Now you they'd redo it, and they're like, "Who's president in 2020? Donald Trump? Donald Trump? <laughs> <laughs> the guy from the game? Trump the game? Um, yeah, a uh, wallet guy always comes to mind. Um. I feel like there's there's someone else who I'm um, forgetting. I mean, the band are always um, the Moonlighters. What's their name? Starlighters. The, the Starlighters. Uh, forgive me. That's I've sinned in the Back to the Future <laughs> fandom. I called them the Moonlighters. They're so good. And um, led by Marvin Barry. You know, it was Mark. funny. I did, it wasn't as overt when I was a kid, but you know, when he calls it, Chuck, yeah. it's your cousin, Marvin Barry. <laughs> like he know. doesn't know his cousin's last name. <laughs> you know what I mean? Marvin, Marvin Barry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, James Tolkien's great. Mm. He was like all over in the 80s. I remember he was in Top Gun too. Absolutely. He said, Your ego's writing, your body's writing checks, your ego can't. Your ego's writing checks your body can't cash. He was always getting in people's faces and yelling at them. Um, yeah, I, I mean, for me, the king is always um, a wallet guy. I think he took his wallet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wallet I guy's way up there. Yeah. yeah. I, I heard some. Yeah, yeah. The punches in those movies are so intense. They always look like they hurt so bad. I had recently heard Jeffrey Weissman on some podcast or something talking about his experience, which it sounded like it sucked for that dude. Like, I feel bad for him, like, in just in terms of how that all went down and, like, the cast was kind of like, okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was an impossible mission that he was on. Yeah. Crispin Glover's performance is so I feel like he should have been nominated for an Academy Award. It's so weird, but so good. But I can imagine shooting it being like, this is either 
insane and bad or like next level good i can't tell you know what i mean but when you see it you're just like yeah that's george he's weird yeah i but, when i got to talk to crispin uh he was promoting oh, a movie awesome. he was in and i got to talk to him a little bit of a back to the future and the one thing that i wanted to talk to him about is because his line deliveries are so unusual and then yeah. they're accompanied by these odd body motions and i was just asking yeah. him we what where was that coming from like where did you get that and i think he was just like I just was feeling it, you know, this character. And it was very, it was very Crispin Glover-y, the whole interview was. And right. no one else could have pulled it off. And that's why I feel bad for Jeffrey Wiseman. To a certain extent, it was an impossible mission that he was on. Yeah. There's no way. And I think that he did the very best that he could with what he was given. You know what I mean? Which was a yeah. smaller role than the first. Prosthetics on his face, hung upside down to be disoriented. <laughs> Did you see in the behind the scenes, there's like a shot when they're shooting it of Spielberg on set. And he, he says something to Jeffrey that's like maybe a knock on Crispin Glover. I can't, I, I just remember. I being think like, he called Ooh. him Crispin or yeah, something like he, that. Yeah. He did something like that. Um, yeah. I always felt uh, the more I hear about it, the more it seems like a very difficult situation to walk into. But um yeah, I think in terms of, uh, I'm trying to think. Of, I'm so, I'm still on trying to think of other side characters. Uh, <laughs> but yeah. I do think Crispin Glover should have been nominated for Kevin Moore. So insane and good, so good. One hundred percent should have gotten a supporting actor. I mean, uh, just a nomination. Just a not. He didn't yes. have to win it, but just a nomination. Recognize greatness when you see it. <laughs> uh, 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 uh. <laughs> so crazy in that peanut brittle scene that the where they cut out does he yeah. buy a bunch of peanut brittle that they cut it out it's so interesting and then also the ending how um i guess crispin glover had an issue with the ending that it was like about oh they have a better house and wealth and everything yeah what um, i could see maybe that doesn't go over now in 2020 but right. back in the 80s that seemed like to be like a pretty quintessential ending. yeah a hundred percent i remember being a kid being like his life is i just remember seeing that truck and being like oh my god that's the coolest <laughs> truck i've ever seen in my life um but what's funny is they have all this money but they still live in the same house they just still live it. <laughs> yeah <laughs> and decorate differently <laughs> yeah and they just picked up tennis i guess um, I know, I know. What'd you hit your head? That that he does some amazing pratfalls in that movie when he's putting on um the the jeans. I would have you ever seen aside from what they've released any of the Eric Stoltz stuff? And do you think they'll ever? They probably won't release. So it, right? it's interesting that you bring that up because I heard Bob Gale before say in a documentary. It was the Back in Time documentary. He said you know, hey, eventually maybe that'll come out, right? So he kind of left that mm -hmm. door open. And then I had a friend who's a part of this DeLorean car club, and they did like an exclusive Q&A with Bob Gale a couple days ago or a week ago. And he said uh -huh. it'll never be released because they, it was like kind of, in his words, it was bad, and they don't want <laughs> right. Eric Stoltz to look bad or look worse right, by right, any right. means. And I'm right. sure Eric Stoltz I, – I, I really do wonder about Eric Stoltz. I would love to talk to him and be like, do you think about Back to the Future like every day or do you never think about it? It's one of the two. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's – it's truly crazy how much work they did on it and what the movie became. Like it was obviously a massive hit at the time, but it's it's kind of – its impact and like staying power and what it means. It's truly like a special movie. It's not just like, oh, it made a bunch of money and it dominated the summer. Like it, it's much more than that. It's, it's one of those movies that are truly like special to so many people. So yeah, it, I feel like if it was me every day, I'd be like, I don't want to see, <laughs> I don't, I, don't want to see anything that could possibly remind me that um, I was a part of that. But it's it's also weird to see pictures and he's like wearing different stuff too. Yeah. Like they were like, oh, we're going to go, we're going to make Marty look different as well in terms of his wardrobe. I, I'm just so fascinated. I just want to see scenes so bad.
I do too. Um, and, and and apparently it gotten to that point to where I mean they had done so much on the movie, it would gotten to the point to where they were talking about, oh, so what are you gonna work on next? Like, oh, you know, oh yeah, I'm gonna go do oh, this right. TV show, or I'm gonna go do this. So essentially, they were wrapped. They were completely right. wrapped almost. And then to reshoot all of that, and you know, I don't know. To me, and and you probably know this better as a performer. Whenever you nail something that first time around, then they say, "Hey, we got to go reshoot that." You're like, "Oh, to get back in that mentality yeah, to go do totally. all that again, especially for someone like Christopher Lloyd who has this big bomb and Crispin Glover, these big bombastic roles and unique ways of of approaching their characters to have to recapture right. that all again. To go do it again, yeah, it would be like, "Oh, really? Can you use any of the close-ups?" <laughs> <laughs> Well, that is some good stuff there. <laughs> Tom Wilson says it's still Eric Stoltz's hand. That's oh, right, that him punches in the him. Diner. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you see like a. Yeah, that is crazy. I, I just feel like it's the holy grail of like, um, nerd. Like, where is it? Who has it? Is it like in a vault somewhere? Did they like destroy it? It's probably not destroyed. I guess. I don't know. I, I'd just be so interested. Like, I would literally watch, um, like, video of them shooting every single day of that movie. Like, I, I'm endlessly fascinated with the process. Yeah. It's so um, just fascinating, and I'm, I'm just so intrigued by, like, every little behind-the-scenes decision and stuff. Like, it must have been. I wonder how long they were like, oh, this isn't working out. We need to change Marty. Like how long they were shooting before they, that kind of inkling started in their heads, you know, it's cause that's intense to be like, we have to reshoot most of the movie. <laughs> to me, you would know day. I feel like you would know day one. Day one. Yeah. I feel like, like you'd be like, ah. Oh. Well, hey, maybe we can get there. You know, maybe we can get there. Maybe yeah. we can get there. And then you just realize at that point, okay, we're six weeks, seven weeks into this thing, and we haven't gotten there yet. <laughs> I know, yeah. Oh. It's cool they had Spielberg around to be like, all right. And that whole story, how they called it, um, the studio guy wanted to call it like space, space man, from, man Pluto. from Pluto. Yeah. And then Spielberg <laughs> said, they were like, that's hilarious, man. Oh my God, we laughed so hard. Thanks for the laugh. And he was like, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a joke. It was a joke. So you'd appreciate this. There was an Eli Roth movie that came out uh, maybe a year ago, two years ago, with Jack Black called The House with the Clock in Its Walls. And oh, yeah, a, yeah, yeah. There's was a it scene. Kate Blanchett in it, maybe? Uh, yeah, Something I think else? maybe. Um, um, I didn't get to see it, but in the trailer, there's a scene where there's a bus pulling up to some you know, street or what have you, and there's an old movie theater behind it, and the marquee says, Spaceman from Pluto. <laughs> oh, amazing. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. So a nice little Easter egg. Have you ever yeah. gotten in, in, you know, you've been around in entertainment, like I said, for, for a long time. I, I would watch <laughs> you on Wild and Out, not Wild even joking. Wild Out, that's so funny. I loved Wild and Out, <laughs> you know, Wild yeah, Style, uh, all the Back skits the that y'all used to do. Um, and it's funny to see you and Taryn, you know, now all the uh, on SNL. But um, yeah. Um, and then did you, Pete as well. Pete and, did a season. Yeah. Or then, Wild so, Mount as well. And then so for you though, um, obviously SNL is one of the biggest shows, if not the biggest show in television history. Um, have you been able to brush shoulders with anybody related to Back to the Future? Has it has any of the cast or Zemeckis, right. Spielberg, anybody that you've been able to meet? Um. None of the cast, although I would freak out. Um, Spielberg, I think Spielberg's like friends with Lauren. And it was, it was my first season as a cast member because I was a writer for three years and then joined the cast. Um, so it was my first season as a cast member and it was the season finale. And there was a Jurassic Park, the ride sketch. The sketch took place on the ride. And I played like the ride attendant. Um, so I was wearing what they wear at Universal Studios, which is like a, you know, khaki themed or whatever, you know, safari theme. It has a Jurassic Park logo on it, on the shirt. And I was standing by the set. It, 
I think it was dress rehearsal, but it was like in between sketches where they were setting up and I was just waiting before the sketch on the studio floor. And then I heard someone go, hey, I know that. And I look and it's Steven Spielberg and I'd never met Steven Spielberg. And to me, like Steven, he's one of those people that just seems larger than life. Like he's almost mythical. He's not a real person, and, and, right? Yeah. And like what he's been a part of and what he's done was so important to me growing up. So, and from hanging out, not expecting to see Steven Spielberg, <laughs> to see Steven Spielberg right next to you, I was just like, like almost, cause that show you're used to working and seeing famous people. So I feel like it gives you a certain amount of, you're able to have some chill around people. Some people you might have grown up watching, but, I just looked at him and he was pointing to the Jurassic Park thing like, hey, I know, I know that. And I don't know why I said this. I said, and it just like came, like I wasn't thinking. I just said, yeah, the sketch doesn't take place in the actual Jurassic Park though. It takes place on the ride. Okay. <laughs> like what? And I don't know why I said it. And I ju that's just the first thing that came out and he went, Oh yeah, I know. I I think he had like read it or he, he was aware and he was like, no, I know. And then he was very polite and then he just kind of resumed being on his way. And I was just like, I met Steven Spielberg and I said the weirdest, like, it doesn't take place in the park though. It takes place on the ride. Like he was saying it did like, I, and then I spent like the next week being like thinking of stuff I could have said, like, I wish I would have gone spared no expense and like, look like something related to the movie. But that was my experience with, with Spielberg. But to this day, I think about that and I'm like, Oh, it wasn't the worst thing in the world. I didn't like piss myself <laughs> or <laughs> vomit on him or something, but it was just, odd you know what I mean like I w wish that interaction had I would have said something what's, at least what's that funny, kind of made sense what's funny too I don't know if you know but uh Steven Spielberg legendarily when he would ride the Jurassic Park ride when it got to the top <laughs> to, to do uh -huh. the big drop he would have the ride stop and he would get off and then walk down this little back flight of steps because he didn't want to do the big drop oh really yeah <laughs> that's so funny I like that he has that power, whereas anyone else, it's like, you're going down. Stop. Oh, that's so funny. Wouldn't it be great I if he just yelled, ride. cut? <laughs> cut. cut. <laughs> Reset. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, that's so funny. Yeah, but I haven't met um, anyone else. I know Michael J. Fox hosted back in the day, because I remember watching and I think they did like a Back to the Future sketch for his monologue or something and being fascinated by it, but no one else. I mean, I would, I would like to, I'd like to meet everyone. And yeah. Robert Zemeckis too, but I'm sure, I wonder how many times people talk about Back to the Future and he's like, uh-huh, uh-huh, sure. <laughs> yeah, I get it. I've done I get other it. stuff too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, you liked it? Cool. Yeah. You and everybody else in the world. <laughs> He's like, oh, no, I see this dude. He looks like he was born in the 80s. He's going to talk to me about Back to the Future. <laughs> but, um, but again, also, it should be a you know compliment that 35 years later, people still want to talk about this one yeah. movie that you did uh, that you actually created, too. It wasn't like he just directed it, like Romancing the Stone. Right. He and Bob Gill, they created it. So, I mean, they like it, wrote it, right? They yeah. wrote it together, yeah. Mm -hmm. And the turnaround sounded crazy too. Like they didn't have that much time before it came out, and um, fin they finished shooting, I guess. Which is so they shot for that six, seven weeks, and then they had a mandate to get it out by a certain time, or the studio literally said, "We're not going to put the movie out if you don't get it done <laughs> by this time." And then you know they, they shot for that six, seven weeks, like, and they're oh, like, oh, oh, "Oh, we got to recast the main character," <laughs> and then. They Don't do it. worry, though. <laughs> Let's see. Where is it? So I have these two things. So the original date for Back to the Future was July the 19th, 1985, and they released these little pins, right? Um, oh, shit. Yeah. Where did you get that? 
This this was a, a deep dive find on uh I believe it was eBay one day. Oh but, my um, god, it's gorgeous. So, so it's supposed to be blue. It, the lo original logo was blue, and it was going to be July nineteenth. And then the studio did some test screenings, and they're like, "This movie is great. Let's move up the <laughs> release date three weeks or what have oh, you no. to July third, oh, nineteen eighty five." Wow. And they changed the colors. So then think about those poor editors. They were like. Okay, we have this quick turnaround time. Wait a minute, we have two weeks less? What are y'all doing to me? What? Because it's good? Okay, <laughs> we're trying to make it better. Oh my God, that's crazy. I can't believe you have those pens. I have yeah. this, I forgot to, it's a DMC. I don't know if you can see. DeLorean DMC watch. watch, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, it's not the car, but I it's wish it was. It's the next best thing. I can't believe, I remember the pens. I just wish, I wish I could go back and as a kid be like, can I have one of those pens? It was like, um, I think it's when they, when the third one came out, they screened all of them, mm -hmm. but it was like, I watched, it was like, I watched the trilogy back to back to back with the back and the font. And I remember seeing it on a uh, person who worked at the movie theaters vest. And I wish 10 year old me was like, uh, can I have one of those? <laughs> um <laughs> yeah that the the fact that you have the original date um, on that pen is amazing yeah that's on july keeper. 19th i'm going back yeah you have some incredible stuff i, I mean some, you I probably cool met a lot of people working on your book right so i got to talk to a lot of them right so i got to talk to leah thompson crispin glover Don Full of Love, who played Mayor Goldie Wilson. Yeah, uh, he's Mar awesome. The, the guy who played Marvin Barry gave me the greatest quote of all time to put on the back of the book. Um, so well, yeah, what did got, he say? So he said, um, here, well, hold on, let me see. So he said, uh, Back from the Future by Brad Gilmore is one of the most engaging flights of fantasy that you will have. Gilmore has given <laughs> us some stories and ideas that are unique, and you will love them for all time. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, what a he, cool dude. He tied in. Uh, be and then he said, "Be an Earth angel and give this some time to marinate on your brain. It's sure to set you on a new time travel adventure." It was a great quote. I had to put it. I told him, "You need to put that on the back of the book." Um, but yeah, yeah. You'll so. be so engrossed. Your mind will be in that book. You'll lock your keys in your trunk. <laughs> <clears throat> um, speaking of quotes, this would be my last question for you because I've literally kept you for longer than I expected. Oh, I, I all apologize. Good. Um, all good. Best quote from the movie. There's so many great ones. Uh, you're telling me you built a time machine out of a DeLorean. Heavy. Great Scott. Those are all really yeah, cool ones. Yeah, the stainless steel construction. Yeah. Um, Ronald Reagan, the actor. Um, I mean, there's a the lot actor? of great ones. There's a lot of great yeah. ones. So what to you, what is Mikey Day's quintessential quote from Back to the Future? You've quoted a lot during this broadcast. I know. So. I mean, sometimes... There's weird ones that I've heard so much that are just like, like I'll find myself like, who the hell is John F. Kennedy? Like if I hear a name, <laughs> if I hear a name I don't know, I'll be like, who the hell is blank? Just like involuntarily. Um, for some, they, I, it's probably more obscure ones. Like I love, what's a rerun? <laughs> right, yeah. Um, um, weight has <laughs> weight has nothing to do with it while they're walking um, to the school. <laughs> yeah, those are the and lines. A lot of get Doc's me. runs are fantastic. Or witness the birth of Christ. That's something I always was fascinated by. In terms of like you input the date in the time circuits. Like, how does, what technology makes you go to that date? Like, is it supplying a certain amount of power to the flux capacity? You know what I mean? Like, putting in yeah. the time circuits, what mapping, that was always, an, not an issue, but I was always like, what's going on there? To me, I've justified it in my head. Like, if you go back millions of years, it provides more like power to the whatchamacallit plutonium and the flux capacitor but like if you're going back a week it doesn't 
it doesn't provide as much power. I don't know. That in my dork, in my thinking about it, in my dork ponderings, that's what I've come up with. I've never I should ask Robert that, Zemeckis. You should. If I ever meet, and he'll be like, I don't know, dude. It's a movie. <laughs> you bought it, right? It's so funny that you just buy it. You're like, yep, that that could take you back in time. I can't believe it was going to be a refrigerator too. That would have been so, or whatever, a box or whatever. It was whatever. a refrigerator, yeah. Yeah, and then they ended oh, up doing that in Indiana Jones 4, nuking the refrigerator. Oh, yeah. yeah. He's like, yeah. I got my refrigerator. <laughs> we finally have got it into the movie somehow. I'll actually send you an article that I just read today when we get off um, from Please. Bob Gale talking about the original opening that they had shot with Eric Stoltz. This was the first time I had ever heard this. And it wasn't oh, really? the clock opening. Yeah, no. What Marty was, was it? like Marty was in either. detention, and he came up with some way to get out by setting off fire alarms or, or sprinklers. It was something weird. I, I read oh, it today. Oh, really? I'll send it to you. Yeah. Uh, really, oh, really that's awesome. different. Yeah. So that's, that's the footage so I want to see. Yeah. Yes. I mean, I want to see it all. Maybe Bob Gale has it at his house. <laughs> <laughs> in like yeah. a fireproof safe. Yeah. Uh, you in the in the yellow to... box that the plutonium came in is where he has yeah. it stored and safe. Yeah, yeah. Use pinball machine parts. That's another line. That's great. Use pinball machine parts is great. Mikey Day, yeah. I tell you, man, this was fantastic to talk to you. I thank feel like you we could go on so in a couple hours. I really yes, feel like we could. Thank you. Hopefully I made sense. I know I rambled on a lot, but hopefully there's something usable in here of me kind of going off on tangents and stuff. But thank you for having me. It's awesome. And I'm excited to read your book. Uh, it is on the way. That is the great Mikey Day from Saturday Night Live. Mikey, appreciate you, man. Thank you so much. Thanks, Brad. Hey, the future is what you make it. Oh, Brad, what have you done now? Hey guys, Brad Gilmore here from Back to the Future, the podcast. And if you're out there looking to rent a DeLorean time machine, well, let me tell you the number one place to do so. That's DeLoreanRental.com. DeLoreanRental.com. They have the DeLorean time machine all across the United States from Los Angeles all the way to NYC and even a few in the UK, Germany, France, Italy, and adding more cars daily. Check out their packages online to see what would be your best fit for your event. And I'm talking, man, if you need to go to whatever it is to have a DeLorean, if you're looking to rent a DeLorean time machine for a birthday, corporate event, wedding, anniversary, or party, whatever it is that you're looking for, just go to DeLorean Rental. Dot com. Again, that's DeLoreanRental.com. It's the one-stop shop and place to get a DeLorean time machine for your special event. Do it today. Don't run out of time. Hit that book now button on DeLoreanRental.com to get a quote. Again, DeLoreanRental.com. That's DeLoreanRental.com. Hey, guys, before we start the show this week, want to remind you, April 14th is the big day, the big, big day. It is Back from the Future, a celebration of the greatest time travel story ever told, a book by me, Brad Gilmore, based upon a lot of the stuff that we talked about on Back to the Future, the podcast, and a host of more, more, more greatness and Back to the Future goodness. So if you want to get the book, go over to Amazon.com, BarnesandNoble.com, IndieBound.com, or BackFromTheFutureBook.com. And get yours today. You can get a you can get a copy today. You can pre-order it, and it'll be in your inbox, mailbox, wherever your box is. You can get it on April the fourteenth. So if you if you get this book and you like it, you know, read it with a glass of milk, chocolate. As they said in the film, Back to the Future, where we're we going, we don't need roads. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, Doc. Are you telling me you built a time machine? Out of a DeLorean? Marty! You've got to come back with me! Where? The future! <laughs> Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Brad Gilmore Show On Demand and a special edition of Back to the Future, the podcast. Um, this morning is a crazy day. It's been a crazy morning already. And um, today when I woke up is April the 14th, 2020. And it was the release of my book, Back from the Future, a celebration of the greatest time travel story ever told. It's it, it's wild for me to have a book out on Barnes & Noble, Amazon, all the great places. And um, I was doing all this prep work, getting ready for the book to come out. And I got this email about an interview uh, you know, to promote 
this episode of the Goldbergs, and when I saw who was doing the interview rounds, I, I really couldn't believe it. It was the incomparable Miss Leah Thompson, who we all know as Lorraine Baines, Lorraine McFly, Maggie McFly, and don't be forgetting the missus. We, we, we know her from Back to the Future 1, 2, and 3, and I was like, how crazy is it that on the day my book comes out, Leah Thompson is doing radio interviews, and I, I get to have her. So this, this is an interview I'm about to play here in a minute that I did with Leah Thompson for ESPN 975, KFNC, over there in Houston, Texas, or here in Houston, Texas. And um, this is the, uh, the, this, the cutout from the interview that I'm going to put on the podcast feeds here because it, it is, it's nuts. It's nuts that I was able to talk to her, and she's so talented, and she's so lovely. She's so charming. I tried not to fanboy out too much on the interview. I was trying to keep it, you know, professional as much as possible. But I also want to shout out everybody who's gotten the book already on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, all those great places. Um, it's wild that, you know, during these times, we need something to take our, our minds off of it. And it's crazy that I have a book out about Back to the Future. I think the most rewatchable movies of all time and, and all the great feedback I've already gotten from people who've gotten it in the mail. I know Amazon, they're, they're delaying shipments by a couple days if you ordered through Prime because of all the stuff going on. They're, they're prioritizing other supplies right now, but you'll get the book. You will get the book. You can still get it from me, at Brad Gilmore. Hit me up on Twitter, at Brad Gilmore, and I will get you a, a copy of the book if you want to buy directly from me. I'll sign it. You know, limited edition bookmark will be in there as well. But it's so crazy that, that, that it's out today, and um, it's number, so when, when we announced it was number one on Amazon, the day that we announced, it went to number one. And then it kind of fell off for a little bit. And then the day that it's released, it's number one as well. So I feel like, you know, I remember Jay Leno and Johnny they, uh, Carson, they both said, you know, when you take over the Tonight Show, it's number one. And when you leave, it needs to be number one. And I feel like I announced with it being number one, and it's debuting out at number one on Amazon. It's a blessing. Thank you to Mango. Thank you to Hugo. Everyone over there, Hannah, all the great people over at uh, Mango Publishing for allowing me to write this book, a celebration of my love for these films. And um, I, I, I just feel that it's so crazy. Again, its density has brought us together. Miss Leah Thompson is doing my show today. But I also want to shout out a couple other people real quick. I want to shout out Stephen Clark from BackToTheFuture.com. I want to shout out to Jason McFly over there at Back to the Future HQ for doing a lot of promotion. I want to shout out to the What the Flux podcast for having me on to talk about it. All the people who've been able to, um, who've reached out and either purchased the book from me directly, uh, shout out to all of you. I want to give a big shout out to every, all my Schmodown fam, Christian, Mark, everyone over there at the Schmodown, Frank, Kevin, for um, everyone who, who supported me throughout this and to help me uh, promote this book. Uh, just shout out to y'all. It's, it's been a crazy journey. It was a lot of work, but um, it's out now and you can get it. Uh, you can click the link probably in the description of this podcast, or you can go over to Amazon, Barnes & Noble. You get the audio book. The audio book is on there. I think I want to reach out to the guy who read it, Joe, and maybe have him on so we can talk a little back to the future. But um, it's it's available on audio, Kindle, Nook. A any place you can get a book, you can find it. Apple Books. Go get Back from the Future, a celebration of the greatest time travel story ever told. And then tomorrow, April 15th, uh, why don't you check out the episode of The Goldbergs with Miss Leah Thompson, who's acting and directing in it. Uh acting and directing in it she's directing it and acting in it you can tell i'm still a little discombobulated i am i'm having a, a real freak out moment that i just talked to leah thompson earlier this year i talked to crispin and crispin's so interesting and i was kind of intimidated by that interview a little bit even though we were just doing like a light you know movie promo thing it it was a bit intimidating to have him um on because you you hear all these things about crispin and, and he's so so um i don't know he's so passionate about what he does and he's so intelligent and bright and so I wanted to make sure that I gave him a good interview. And then I wanted to do Leah the same. And then you'll hear her reaction when I said that I wrote a Back to the Future book. But um, once that happened, I was completely fanboying out <laughs> and I couldn't control myself. So here we go. Let's get into it right now. Miss Leah Thompson on my show today. Let's go. And she joins me on the phone right now, Miss Leah Thompson, the incomparable Miss Leah Thompson. Leah, how are you doing this morning? I am so happy to be talking to you. Well, thank you. I I'm glad to be talking to you. I have a lot to get to, but a little bit of time. So let's jump right into it, though. Goldberg's going down tomorrow. Uh, you are directing this episode, and you are finally guest starring on the show. Uh, so many episodes you've directed uh, before. Why was this the right one to say, you know what, I'm going to get in front of the camera as well? 
I don't know. The writers just came up with it. They, they, it was, it's called the Formica King. So they needed a Formica queen. So they naturally thought of me. <laughs> and, uh, I, uh, I was like, sure, I'll do it. And then, you know, I was already going to be there to direct it. So it worked out perfectly. Um, and I, you know, I love the cast and the crew. I've been doing it for three, four years, like 10 episodes. So it, it just feels like home to me. And, uh, I, I I was a little nervous. That's I have to say I was a little nervous, um, but I I had a great time and there there's great co-stars and um, I knew everybody and so it was just perfect. And you know it's I feel so. I mean, it's so a lot of times you can kind of gloss over what we do as being trite, but you know we all need to laugh now. So I'm I'm really happy that we have a nice new episode for America to laugh a little bit tomorrow. Oh, absolutely. That's a, that's a noble cause. It's needed right now. It's needed right now. Um, but but when yeah. you're directing an episode and then acting in it as well, what is is there any challenges with that? Obviously, it's, it's a little bit hard sometimes to critique yourself, isn't it? What are the challenges to do both at the same time? Well, it, the biggest challenge is getting someone to respect me while I'm wearing giant shoulder pads and fake <laughs> nails. That's that's true. Um, but I've been, you know, I kind of ha- I started directing myself, so it seems kind of natural, and uh, it's a little awkward, you know. But you have you have friends that look out for you. Um, you know, one of the writers was like, "You're doing the accent too strong. Do it a little less," or you know, stuff like that. So people just look out for you, but. It, it, I think it would be really hard if it was, I've never had to direct myself in a really, really dramatic scene or really angry scene. I think that would be hard to do, but, um, it, it kind of comes naturally to me. And, uh, this was, you know, relatively simple. It's only a few scenes, but I also weirdly directed school, which is on afterwards. So it's like two directing shows in a row. So I'm kind of excited about that. That's awesome, and, and you, you've really jumped full force in the directing. I know you had your feature debut, The Year of Spectacular Man, uh, Spectacular Men. Talk about the transition just to go full into directing. It really seems like something that you connect with. Yeah, it's such a joy because I, I, you know, I know I've learned so much. I know so much about the business having done it for, like, I don't know, 38 years. And so it's really fun to kind of use all that I've learned you know, have it all and be able to use it as a director. So um, I just really, really enjoy it. And I really enjoy kind of being in control, like being the boss. It's not like that when you're an actor. You're kind of, um, you know, just kind of you're the CEO of your character's department, but you don't have to deal with anything else. So it's really fun to be, you know, really have your hands on and all the departments and, and also to be really encouraging to the younger actors and the, the less seasoned performers, you know, to really be able to give them advice and help. That's super gratifying to me. I really enjoy that aspect of it. And I got a chance to direct a lot of different things. I have a Katie Keene coming up, which is a, a, you know, kind of like a more glossy, you know, fancy show. And then I did a, I have a star girl that I directed that's coming out in May and that's all special effects and stunts and flying around and superheroes. And so I've had a chance to do uh, a lot of different styles and genres. And that's really fun too. I, I appreciated that as a performer and I also appreciate that as a director to be able to kind of bounce around and try different things. Absolutely. And and for me, sometimes when I'm listening to other people or I'm watching, you know, someone on television, a host, I say, man, I really love how she did that. or I love how he did that. I'm, I'm going to take that. I'm going to use it in my arsenal now. Is there any director that you've worked with on the acting side of things that you've been directed by and you say now, oh, I can implement such and such as, you know, technique here? Yeah, a lot. And that's the, that's the interesting, unique perspective you have from being an actor. You've worked with so many directors and, uh, but I, I, a lot of times I, I really do reference uh, Bob Zemeckis, who directed me in Back to the Future 1, 2, and 3. He had a really great eye for um, uh, filling up the frame with content. You know, he you could watch Back to the Future a bunch of times and see different things. And I, I try to do that. I try to put, 
put as much story as I can in every shot. And uh, so I, I kind of use his, his, you know, template. And, uh, but I did get to work with, and, and my husband, Howard Deutsch, who directed me in some kind of wonderful, he has a really great way of, of, of really concentrating on the actors. A lot of directors don't even like actors. And he really loves actors and, and tries to get the best out of every scene that way. And so I've learned a lot from him as well. Um, it, you, you brought it up, and, and it's so crazy to, for me to be able to talk to you today on the 14th because um, the Back to the Future is my greatest, is my favorite f- film of all time. And today I actually have a book out about Back to the Future. I wrote a book about Back to the Future that comes out today. And um, talk to me about the movie, though. Why, why do you think these films... Somebody like me, I was born after all the movies came out, but they're still my favorite films of all time. I connect with them on a real personal level. Why do you think those movies are so timeless? That's insane. I can't believe you just said that. That's insane. What's the book called? It's called Back from the Future, A Celebration of the Greatest Time Travel Story Ever Told. I would love to find a way to get you a copy. That would be amazing. I can't wait to read it. I'm so... I, I'm just so in shock that you. I, 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 you didn't even seem like you were a fan. That's incredible! Oh my god! I tried not oh to fanboy out too much. I tried not to fanboy out too much, but I'm having a moment right now. Oh my god! You're my, you're a dreamboat for sure. Oh, <laughs> look at that! That's at that. so cool! I can't wait to read your book. Yes, thank oh you. I will god, definitely I want to get. I will get one to you. I, I will figure it out. Maybe I can hit you up on Twitter. And we'll do it that way? Yes, please. Okay. Please, but let me ask you, where can I get it? Amazon, Barnes & Noble. Where all, all the All the great places. Amazon, Barnes & Noble. It's available everywhere today. Amazon. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Barnes & Noble. So I can just, I can go on the internet and get it. You can. That's incredible. You can. Oh, my God. I'm so excited. I'm excited that you're excited. How long did it take you? No, no. How long did it take you to write it? About a good year, but, you know, a good lifelong, uh, you know, decades of research just based on watching the movies dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of times. And, uh, yeah, it came out today. It's kind of crazy that this whole thing happened with you and I. I when I saw it, I was like, this is, this is density, I guess, or destiny. <laughs> oh, my gosh, that's so exciting. Huh. I'm sorry. I had to stop and just be amazed about that. It's such a it's such a, an amazing thing to have been so lucky to create something that has has such ripples and in through generations, you know, because I'll do a and a with 2000 people and a good half of them weren't even born when the movie came out. And and I, I, I just feel so lucky. And it's also such a beautiful movie, like what it says, what it you know the idea that that you if you do if you have stand up and have courage for one moment in your life it could change not only your life but the people you love's life you know the 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 metaphors and the it's so resonant to people and we're all still kind of mystified how it kind of like died down and came back and it keeps coming back as as people show their children and their children's children it's such a I feel so grateful, you know, and so thank you for writing a book about it. That's so cool. No, thank you. Thank you for giving a timeless performance. Um, quite literally. I mean, now we're coming up on 35 years, uh, the 35 year anniversary of the first movie. And it's just, it's just awesome to talk to you. And I will be parked in front of the television set watching your episode, of the Goldbergs going down tomorrow, where you'll be acting and directing it. I wish I had more time with you. I know they're keeping you on a tight schedule, but it was an absolute honor and privilege and uh, dream come true to be able to talk to you on, on this day of all days. Congratulations. And I wish you all the best luck with it. I hope it's a blockbuster. Oh, thank you. Thank you. That is the incomparable Miss Leah Thompson. Check out her episode of The Goldbergs going down tomorrow on ABC. Leah, thank you so much. Hey, guys, want to take a quick second to tell you about this Eagle Moss DeLorean buildup that I've been working on. So it's really cool. Eagle Moss has a subscription service where you can build your own DeLorean time machine, and they send it to you in a subscription service format. Every month or so, you get uh, some of the parts for the DeLorean. They give you magazines that are step-by-step instructions about how you can actually get this. So I've just started on it. I have parts one and two, but you can sign up today. It's a really great deal. It's a total risk-free trial offer. You get issues number one and issues number two parts and the magazines, plus 
a free exploded diagram poster. And get this, guys. This is the deal of a lifetime. It is a dollar and 95 cents plus free shipping that is the 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 trial offer the risk-free trial offer issues one and two with the parts magazine and exploded diagram poster for one dollar and 95 cents plus free shipping you can't get any better than that go to eaglemoss.com that's eaglemoss e-a-g-l-e-m-o-s-s dot com and sign up and build the back to the future delorean today Hello, welcome to Back to the Future, the podcast, the only podcast looking back in time with the greatest film trilogy of all time, Back to the Future. I'm your friend in time, Brad Gilmore, and boy, do we have a special treat for you today. Um, going to get to that in just a minute, but I want to shout out to a YouTube channel at uh, Dominic 1701P for the Back to the Trap remix, which I'm enjoying. Check this out. That brother's killing it. I love that. Anyway, welcome to the show, guys. Um, so much to talk about. This is an impromptu season premiere for season number six of Back to the Future, the podcast. I know that we didn't think that we were going to get it so early, and I did not expect to bring it so early to you. But 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 it's an emergency situation. I'm feeling like a DJ today. It's an emergency situation because we have the one and the only Crispin Glover on the show today. Let me tell you how this came about. I was doing, um, I, I was sitting at home a couple of days ago, and a friend of a friend of mine, friend of the show. I mean, he hasn't been on the show, but he's a friend of the show, Christian Harloff, who runs the movie trivia Schmodown. He texted me because he hosts a show called Collider Live, and he says. Hey, guess who we're going to have on this week? I said, who? He said, we're going to have Crispin Glover on. And he sent me a picture of George McFly. And I just got so excited. And so I was like, what is he promoting? And he's like, he's got a new movie, uh, Lucky Day, coming out. I said, oh, man. what You, you, you got to tell him I'm a big fan. And I started marking out. I'll be honest with you. I started freaking out that Crispin Glover was going to be on somebody I knew show. And then I realized, wait a minute. I have a radio show. <laughs> Maybe I can get on the promo tour. And through my connects with ESPN Radio, which I host a show on with Booker T called the Hall of Fame, and we're connected to SB Nation Radio, a national radio network, I said, look, let me see if I can finagle an interview here. So I reached out to the PR team, and they were gracious enough to grant me time with the legendary Crispin Glover. So what I'm about to play is a radio interview that I did with Crispin Glover for his new film, Lucky Day, which at the time I'm doing this, October the 10th, October 10th, 2019, Crispin Glover um, movie, the, the Crispin Glover movie, sorry, Lucky Day will be out tomorrow, October the 11th, in select theaters and on on demand. So if, if you're not in one of the theaters or not one of the cities where it's going to be playing in one of the theaters, you can watch it on demand. Crispin Glover plays a hitman. That's awesome. I always got to say, Crispin, as great as he was in Back to the Future Part 1, and I think he's flawless in it, um, his role as the thin man in the Charlie's Angels films was also very good. And he's a great villain. And I think that right now, in the time that we are in 2019, great villains seem to be um, kind of a, a major focus of film. Like, we want to see the villain. We want to see the, the origin of the villain. We want to understand the villain more than we ever have. You see the Joker movie that just dropped. Suicide Squad was a couple years ago. Um, we want to see our villains in the movie, and we want them to feel just as important as the protagonist. And so I, I love that Crispin Glover's in it. I love that he's playing a villain. I love that he's playing a hitman. It sounds perfect. We talk about the film, but we also talk about Back to the Future. Obviously, I couldn't have him on and not talk about Back to the Future. And he is very honest. And you know me. I am I'm apolitical. I do not choose sides on anything. But Crispin is very honest about some of his feelings about the sequels and everything. So, obviously... 
these are these are how he this is how he feels. These are his opinions. These are his um, versions of events. And I am not going to um, shy away from allowing him to share those views on this podcast because he is an integral part of why that first movie worked. You could really say the first Back to the Future movie was really George's movie. He had the character arc, right? The movie is kind of centered around George in a lot of ways. And Marty was more of a supporting character for George, right? I mean, when you think about it. So we talk about Back to the Future. He talks about his relationship with Robert Zemeckis and kind of how this film, Lucky Day, kind of was because of Back to the Future and his relationship with Robert Zemeckis and the, the writers and directors of this movie, uh, Lucky Day. So what I want to do is we're going to go into this interview with Crispin Glover. Now, before I do that, though, I would like to um, I would like for you all to indulge me in listening to the Lucky Day trailer. So here we are. This is Lucky Day 2019. It drops tomorrow. And Crispin Glover is in the movie. So let's let's listen to the trailer and then we're gonna get into our interview with Crispin Glover. Here it goes. Oh Fred, what have you done now? Now, now, now. Honey, I'm home. Oh, yeah. Redmond, no more shortcuts. You have too much to lose. <laughs> the man has returned! 600,000 U.S. treasury now. It's good to be out. It has been a long time. Look, Satya. Oh, shit. You killed my brother. Now it is my pleasure to kill you. And your entire family. Hold on a minute. It just got out of the joint, mate. Literally, this morning. I need some tools. Make it painless. You hear that? So what? Are you looking for revenge? Yeah. That's my car you're breaking into. Oh, it was much more cutthroat here. It is my lock. He cannot be killed. This body like run than I ever could imagine. Shoot the gun! Run. So that is the trailer for Lucky Day. Crispin Glover stars in it. And right now, let's go to the interview that I originally conducted with him for the Brad Gilmore Show, ESPN Radio, to promote the film. Here he is, Crispin Glover. And he joins me on the phone right now. Uh, he has got the new film, Lucky Day, coming out this weekend, uh, October the 11th in theaters. And on demand, the great, the legendary Crispin Glover joins us on the show today. Crispin, how are you, sir? Very well. Good morning. How are you doing? I am great. I'm, thank you so much for taking the time. You know, I'm so excited to talk to you about this new movie. I haven't gotten to see it yet, but it's Lucky Day, and I know that you play a hitman, uh, which sounds like it's going to be awesome for Crispin Glover to be a hitman. Um, tell me a little bit about Lucky Day, because I, I want to know how you got involved with the project, because from what I understand, you had to read the script, and it was a quick turnaround, and you were on the set like a couple days later, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I think it was seven days from when I read the script to being in front of the camera. But uh, it, it was a complex character and there's a dialect and all kinds of things I had to do in a very short time period. But uh, it was obviously a great character. I'd worked with Roger Avery, the writer-director of the film, before. So you were saying, uh, how, how did you, how, you so, you're saying you worked with the yeah. writer-director before? Yes, I worked with Roger Avery previously on a film called Beowulf, which he co-wrote with Neil Gaiman. I'm currently working with Neil Gaiman on the show American Gods, which is based on uh, the beautiful uh, novel he wrote of the same title. And uh, uh, he's the, also the executive producer of American Gods. Uh, but I got this script uh, from Roger. Well, well also, Roger, Roger and Neil originally wrote Beowulf for Roger to direct. Uh, but uh, Zemeckis... Um, Robert Zemeckis, who directed uh, me in Back to the Future, uh, had um, uh, read the script and wanted uh, to buy it from Roger for himself to direct, which he did. 
but he told Roger and Neil that uh, he would cast the people that they uh, had on their uh, their their list, the people they wanted to cast, and I was uh, I was there uh, to play um, to play Grendel, and uh, I you know there had been a lawsuit about uh, the sequel to Back to the Future because the producers had taken uh, the molds that were made of my, my face from the original film for the old age makeup and utilized it to make um, prosthetics uh, to pay, place on another actor's face in order to fool audiences into believing that I was in the film. This, of course, was illegal, and uh, there was a lawsuit about it. And uh, so, you know, after a lawsuit like that, I never expected to work with uh, Robert Zemeckis again. But uh, uh, because uh, of Roger uh, Avery and Neil Gaiman, I'm, I'm grateful that I had this very good experience uh, playing Grendel. I, I loved the character. I loved the script. And I, I had a great experience working with Robert Zemeckis again. So that was a very helpful and reparative thing for me personally. And then I was, uh, like I say, I'm working with uh, Neil Gaiman now on, on American Gods. And then I was very happy when I got this script from Roger. Uh, and obviously the character was just a great character. As soon as I got it, even though there was a very minimal amount of preparation time, I just knew this was a great part to play. So <laughs> get ready and go. And that's, uh, that's what happened. And uh, I'm, I'm very pleased. I'm very happy to be part of it. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think audience are going to like this one. No, and and everything that I've seen about the movie, I'm excited to see Crispin Glover again as a villain. Uh, you know, you play a hitman in the film once again. Lucky day. Uh, but you mentioned that they kind of got you. Uh, the writer director got you back involved with Robert Zemeckis, of course, Back to the Future. Um, how was it? Yeah. You know, the first day you were working on Beowulf. Was it? Was it? Was it? Did you and Ro uh, 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 Robert talk at all about anything that happened in the past, or yeah. were you just moving forward? No, I. No, I, I had a meeting with with Robert Zemeckis before we started shooting. You know, I'd read the book How to Be a Gentleman, which uh, recommends not to bring up any sort of subject. So I I didn't mention anything about Back to the Future. We never talked about it. We just uh, went into to working on the on the the, the script in hand. And uh, you know, I even even though there was all, the, all this stuff that happened with the sequels, I actually had a good working relationship with Robert Zemeckis on both Back in the Future and also ultimately on uh, on uh, Beowulf. He is a, a good director. So uh, we we had a... a I, I'm very glad that I, I got to work with him again and, and, and had a, for me, a reparative uh, sort of uh, situation. And it's unfortunate that there's a different producer named Bob Gale that just won't let this thing rest. And he continues to not accept the fact that he did something that was illegal. And instead of uh, just being quiet about it, as any gentleman should, he continues to blame the victim, me, uh, for stealing my, my face for his personal gain. It's really just really the worst kind of behavior. I'm, I'm surprised that uh, press and, and media do not take him uh, to task for this because what he did was wrong and he should not be allowed to be essentially being a bully. It, it's really not right. Using his platform to make up lies and say things about something that he stole something from is just the worst kind of behavior possible. And I, and I can understand that. Obviously, I mean, full disclosure here, Crispin, you know, two of my favorite films of all time are Back to the Future and Diamonds Are Forever. They both involve a Glover. Of course, your oh, your, your father, Bruce Glover, <laughs> was right. forever memorable yeah. and, in, and in that very, movie. There's a very positive thing that's happening about that. I also uh, make my own film. Uh, I, oh, and you're uh, getting to work with your dad, right? Uh, film. Yeah, well, I, uh, I, I, my father's in the second film I've directed. Next year, 2020, it will be the 15th anniversary of uh, me touring with my shows and films. People can find out when I'm touring with my shows and films on CrispinGlover.com. I regularly tour. Uh, I'll be touring on January 15th. I don't know what city you're in, but I'll be in uh, San Francisco at the Castro Theater starting January 15th, on January 15th with the tw uh, 15th anniversary of touring with my first film, What Is It? My father 
uh, acted in my second film. Actually, my mother did as well. And both of them are in my new film. But the new film was specifically developed for myself and my father to act in together for the first time. We'd never acted together before. And I've been working on this film for many years. And that film will also be ready for audiences in 2020. Uh, so uh, I'll, I, I'm not sure if I'm going to be touring with that film or what kind of distribution I'm going to be doing on the new film, but uh, I am very excited about it. Uh, that's going to be ready next year. That is awesome, and like I said, your, your dad had one of the, the most memorable, even in that you know Sean Connery run with Goldfinger and everything, he had one of the yeah. most memorable villains, you know, yeah. uh, you, Mr. Wint and Mr. Kidd. I'll, I'll never forget those as long as I live. Um, That's right. <laughs> I, only have a couple, I only have a couple minutes yeah, left yeah. with you, but I wanted to ask you, you know, like I said, my other yeah. favorite film, Back to the Future, um, just the thing I've always loved about a Crispin Glover performance, because I've, I've seen a lot of the movies that you've been in, you're such an individual in all your performances, and I remember in Back to the Future, you had these amazing physical movements to accompany your line delivery when you were George McFly. Just a little bit. Right. What went into what went into playing that character? What was your mindset with some of the the movements that accompanied that character? Well, um, I remember that that there, you know it, it, it's complicated. It's probably a little longer than it would take to you know, than we have, but. You know, anything that has the, the, the psychology underneath, whether a character is overcompensating for something or uh, what it is that the character is going through psychologically can certainly manifest itself in not just the words that you're saying, but of course, uh, your, your entire body. And uh, I, I definitely did uh, work on, on that when working on, on Back to the Future. I, I, I try to, uh, you know, figure that out in virtually any character that I play. Some characters end up being more physically apparent than others. Uh, it just depends on uh, on what the character is. And I, I do remember specifically working on uh, uh, psychological aspects that would manifest uh, physically for, for that, that character in Back to the Future. Yeah, I mean, it, it was just an incredible performance. I could talk to you all day. I know you have a book coming out next year, so I would love to have the time maybe eventually yeah. to talk to you about that. But real quick, what is that book going to be about? The the subject of the book, it, it'll be about a lot of things. Uh, it's already a, it's about 450 pages long. I've been working on it for many years. And uh, the subject matter is how propaganda functions in the entertainment United States entertainment industry. Uh, it's something I'm, I'm glad there's some awareness that's starting to come out about, about propaganda, but it tends toward having more to do with news media and politicians. But I don't really see it discussed in the under, about how it works in the entertainment industry. And it's very apparent uh, to me uh, how, how it functions, and I, I think it's an important subject matter. And then it, it pertains to my own filmmaking and experiences I've had in, in the film industry, and I. Uh, next year will be the, the year that that it, it comes out as well. Probably my film, the one with my father, will uh, I'll, I'll have out before and then a little bit later in the year to book. So next year is a big year. More information can be found on ChristianGlover.com. I have all the various, you know, Instagram, Facebook, uh, Twitter, that kind of thing. But uh, there's a newsletter people can find out about where I'm touring with my shows and films. It'll have the information out when my book comes out. And, uh, you know, now that Lucky Day's out, I've been posting things about that. I am excited about the film. I had a great time, and I think uh, I think people are going to enjoy this uh, character in the film a lot. Well, I cannot wait to watch it. Lucky Day again out this weekend in select theaters and on demand. The great Crispin Glover on the phone with me. A thousand thank yous, Crispin. And uh, whenever the book comes out, the film comes thank out, I'd love you. to talk to you again. It was an honor. Yeah, that'd be great. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, you have a good day, and, and good luck with everything else. Thank you. So there, there it was, guys. There was Crispin Glover on Back to the Future, the podcast. Again, that was an interview from something we did on air um, for his promo tour for Lucky Day, the film. Once again, I, I haven't seen it yet, but I'm going to see it first thing when I get home from Reality of Wrestling tomorrow. We have a big live stream going down on our YouTube channel. So I'm going to be watching that as soon as I can because I, I really do love Crispin Glover, and I really, really appreciate the time. Um, that he gave me on the radio show, and I'm, and I'm glad that I'm able to share that with you all because uh, 
I think that this just helps promote his movie even more. I mean, this is this is a big fan base because uh, we all love Crispin from from Back to the Future. And uh, I think while I have you here, I um I have a huge Back to the Future announcement. I mean, massive announcement for fans of the podcast and fans of me and Back to the Future. And I, I can't say it just yet, but I, I'm so excited to be able to share this with you as soon as I can. And it's going to be within the next couple weeks. So just stick with me. Um, I'm going to try to set something up because, once again, I did not expect to have a season six debut already. So I'm going to try to set something up for next week so I can be back here a little bit more quickly, a little quicker, to talk about Back to the Future with you all um, and continue on season six. And as soon as I can make that announcement, make sure you follow me at Brad Gilmore on all social media. Um, listen to this podcast. Make sure you subscribe, rate, review, five stars. Do the whole thing, brother. Because... This is, it's massive. The announcement I'm going to be coming out with is massive for Back to the Future fans and for myself. So once again, thank you. Go see Crispin Glover in Lucky Day if it's in a theater near you. If not, buy it on demand because we all love Crispin and we want more Crispin in our life. Uh, Until then, I'm your friend in time, Brad Gilmore, and I will see you again. And he joins us now on the show, Ryan Parker, the senior staff writer for The Hollywood Reporter. Ryan, welcome to the show. Thanks for doing this. Oh, you bet. Thanks for having me. Well, I'm excited, man, because you... You uh, you're no stranger to breaking news and and having the the internet a buzz, but um, but you recently had a, a pretty big story. A, a Back to the Future plot hole was was filled because of of, of you and, and talking to Mr. Bob Gale. I want to get there. Uh, so just give us a little background on yourself, though. I know you're with the Hollywood Reporter. You've done a lot in this space. Just give us a little bit of background. Uh, sure. Yes, I, I've been with uh, the Hollywood Reporter for uh, geez, coming up on five years now, and. Before that, I was with the Los Angeles Times, and before that, uh, I was with the Denver Post. So, uh, been in the business for well over a decade, and just having a great time. Absolutely love it. Now, I want to break down the story here in a second, but but tell the people what are some other things that that have gotten you? Uh, I don't know, that have set the internet on fire that you've been a part of. Jeez, oh, um, <laughs> uh, that's, uh, that's a great question. I I'm trying to think off the top of my head. Oh, um, a few years ago, I. I got an interview with Rick Moranis who hadn't done press in many years and I was able to do an awesome profile on him that um, people really seemed to enjoy and I became the Rick Moranis guy for a while there so that sort of helped get me you know some credibility within the industry I think absolutely I can't wait I hope I'm hearing that he actually might come back to do something with Honey I Shrunk the Kids is that right that is correct yes he is going to be back for that his uh, first time on the big screen in many years so it's very exciting Oh, we're all excited for that. But this, so Back to the Future, obviously, is, is something that I hold near and dear to my heart. And there was this age old discussion that happened on Twitter. I think it was started by James Gunn. Tell us exactly how this happened. Was it, was it this five perfect movies thing that was going around the internet? That seemed to be the case. Yeah, the, the five perfect movies list that people were uh, getting trending, uh, you know, their personal favorites to watch while in quarantine, which led to a bigger discussion among directors and actors and you know film enthusiasts of just well what makes a movie quote unquote perfect and so that of course got into a much bigger discussion james gunn pointed to a number of movies that he said he loved that weren't necessarily what he would consider a perfect movie and he mentioned back to the future as one that could be considered perfect but that the debate over exactly the end you know could be an argument for why it's not necessarily that perfect now I know that you know, you gotta sometimes keep keep the journalistic integrity and not take sides here, but I feel like this is one that maybe we could break that a little bit. Do you think Back to the Future is a perfect movie? In my personal opinion, it's absolutely a perfect movie. I have always just adored that movie, and anytime I get to write about it, I am just elated. Yeah, I mean, I think that they they knocked it out of the park, and and you got to do something that was real cool. So there was a debate going on, and the actual. Uh, debate was at the when Marty comes back after 1955 and his parents get together because 
you know, Crispin Glover's character, George McFly, knocks out Biff and he stands up for himself. The enchantment under the sea dance is saved. Um, the, the plot hole seemingly was why do his parents in 1985 not recognize Marty McFly as Calvin Klein? Now, I think this is something that people have talked about forever, obviously. Did, was this something, because you consider a perfect movie, was this something that ever crossed your mind or did you think about it for a second and not really care? Uh, it crossed my mind just because it is, you know, fun to sort of debate it and, and, and it makes you think, now everybody has their own personal experience and know that it's even been made fun of, like on Family Guy. So we had to get some sort of resolution on this and you had the idea, you actually spoke to Bob Gill, you reached out to him directly, is that right? I did, I reached out to him directly, I've known Bob for a few years now through various stories that I've done on Back to the Future and uh, I just figured that he'd want to weigh in. One, I knew he'd get a kick out of it because he just loves when people have a good time with his films. And uh, also, I just thought maybe he'd want to set the record straight once and for all, and uh, I got lucky. I mean, did you think that – because here's the thing. He's had to have heard this a million times, right? He's had to have heard this forever. Just as long as he's heard How Are Marty and Doc Friends, I'm sure he's gotten How Did George and Lorraine Not Recognize Calvin. Did you, did you think that he would be as, I don't know, forthcoming as he was to finally end this debate? Uh, I had a pretty good feeling about it. He and I have have a pretty friendly relationship. I guess you could say we're we're pen pal, so to speak, and uh, check in every once in a while. I always wish him a happy birthday, and I've spoken to him for other stories. So I thought I had a pretty decent chance of finally getting this answer out of him. So you, you reach out to him, and he says something that – it was actually something that was crazy, Ryan. I was on a show last week, and somebody asked me this question while I've been talking about my book, and I said something very similar to what Bob Gale said, but he, he essentially said, hey – he was around Marty was around for six days in high school. And how right. many people do you remember? Is that essentially what, what it broke down to? Basically that that's right. He said six days, but then he asked me to make it eight just because he wanted it Saturday to Saturday. Cause he thought that somebody might catch that. So I had to update my story with him noting that. But anyway, that, that's essentially what he was saying is that, you know, think back to you being in high school, you know, 16, you know, 18, 20 years ago, you only met this person, this kid, for a week that, you know, how much would you really remember? Just little tiny things, but not to not enough to think that, oh, my gosh, this is a time traveler and this is the same person. And, and I think that that's kind of logical because I don't know about you, but when I think back to my high school class, I remember like six people out of 900. Oh, I, just, sure. I barely remember anybody. Sure, sure. Well, he made it a point to note that, you know, we're talking about no social media, no, you know, no nothing like that. It's just strictly your memory. So it, it made total sense to me. And when you published the story, I'm sure you had some sort of idea that this actually might this might blow up. Did you did you think that it'd blow up to the extent that it did? Because any YouTube channel that you turn on that talks about movies, any website from Nerdist to on down that covers films and in and, and, and this genre, they've all ran the story. It's been a topic of conversation. Did you think that it would get this much attention? Uh, I had a pretty good feeling about it. I, I, I knew that I had gold uh, because I know that Everybody just loves that movie. Or that, maybe not loves it, but you know, everybody has heard of the movie. Almost everybody has seen the movie, and fans of it just cannot get enough of it. And I knew that this was a huge question that was out there, and the fact that there was finally an answer, I assumed it would go over fairly well. And after the story broke and kind of went everywhere, did you, did you talk to Bob again? Did he reach out and say, wow, I mean, I, I didn't expect this, or did you all have any conversations afterward? Uh, he reached out to me and he said that he, he enjoyed the story and he asked me just to note that to make it, you know, eight days instead of six, just because he knew that there was going to be some fans who say, wait, doesn't he know him from Saturday to Saturday? But you know, that was it. I, I'm sure he had an idea that this was going to be a, a, a thing. He, he's well aware of how much people just love those movies and how they just love talking about them and how we're, you know, talking about it right now. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's coming on the 35th anniversary of Back to the Future 1, the very first film. Um, why do you think, though, out of out of all your experience in, in Hollywood and, and being around these movies, and you see a lot of movies come and go, and they seem like a big deal for a minute, and then they kind of fizzle out. Why has Back to the Future been timeless? It's, I mean, I guess no pun intended with that, but it just seems that, <laughs> no, generationally, it doesn't, it doesn't matter um, if you were born in the 80s, 90s, 2000s. I watched the movies with my nephews who were not t- 9 and 7 a couple weeks ago, and they're obsessed. Why are these movies so timeless, in your opinion? I think it just resonates for folks on many different levels and, and many different ages. I mean, 
when you watch it when you're younger, the idea of time traveling is just so neat. So that alone is one thing. As you get a little bit older and you become a teenager, you start to think of your parents slightly differently and wonder what they may have been like when they were teenagers. So the idea of going back in time and meeting them and seeing if, you know, were they really as good as they said they were? Were they really as bad as they said they were? You know, who, who were they really is a terribly fascinating idea. And then as you become older and you're an adult, you know, it's all about family and your kids and, you know, hoping that you did the best job to raise them and that you were your best person. And I feel like that film touches on all those major cornerstones. I think that you actually just hit it right on the head there. Um, and, and it's something when you're a kid that, that time travel just fascinates you. Um, do you remember, when, did you see the movies in theaters? Did you stumble upon them you know, on cable somewhere? When did you first see Back to the Future? Oh, God. Well, I was born in 82, so I was pretty young when the first one came right. out. But I definitely saw the second and third one in the theaters and absolutely loved them. But I remember watching the first one on VHS and just being absolutely enamored with it. The idea of time travel and just loving Doc and Marty and that relationship and the music was so much fun that even as a little kid, I just was just totally involved. Okay, I got a couple more questions for you here, Ryan, then, then we'll let you go. I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us today um, about Back sure. to the Future. Ryan, again, he he broke the story. He filled the plot hole of, of <laughs> you know, why did George and Lorraine not uh, recognize Calvin Klein slash Marty when he came back to 1985? We have Ryan Parker on the phone. You can follow him on Twitter at the Ryan Parker. But um, if you had the time machine, if you got the DeLorean, if it pulled up to your driveway right there, right now in Los Angeles, California, you got to go in it and go anywhere. You're going forward, you're going back. Where are you going? Uh, uh, back. I'd go back. I think I'd like to go back and see the 50s. Uh, I'm a huge Sinatra fan and, and seeing Sinatra perform in Vegas or, you know, seeing the Beatles live uh, in the 60s, you know, something like that. Seeing, seeing a big act, seeing Elvis, I think would be just terribly fascinating. And I'm right there with you. There's this show, I think it was in St. Louis, Missouri, with the Rat Pack and, and Johnny Carson. And there was a live album of it. And I've always wanted to go back and see that show in person because they were just, it seemed like they were having the, the biggest fun time in the world. Um, and then the movies. You said you, you didn't see the first one in the theaters. You saw it later on VHS. Two and three you saw in the theaters. For you. Where do you? How do you rank these movies? Because for me, as as a huge Back to the Future fan, obviously you got to put one on the pedestal. But my list changes constantly. Sometimes I like three the most. Sometimes I like two. Uh, you know, they, it changes constantly. For you, do you have a defined list of of how you would rank these films if someone asked you to? Like I am right now. You know, <laughs> you know, it's funny because I have to agree with what you're saying. When I was a little kid, I think I liked two the most because I was so. Uh, infatuated with what the future could be, you know, ooh, flying cars and self-fitting clothes and, you know, just crazy hoverboards, you know, that just seemed so neat to me. But as I got older, I really appreciated the first one the most. Uh, I, I, I really enjoyed the messages. And I just remember being just so devastated when I thought Doc Brown was dead and so relieved that he actually read Marty's note. And that still to this day gets me a little teary eyed uh, at that part. So that's, that's definitely got to be my favorite. It's got to be, man. That, that first one is just, they hit it out of the ballpark. It was a grand slam right out of the gate. And the second two, I mean, are phenomenal as well. I love all three of these movies, obviously. Um, now, we talked about Rick Moranis coming back to do Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. He's going to be in the new one. A lot of talk mm -hmm. always online about a Back to the Future sequel. Famously, the Bob's, uh, Bob Gale and Bob Zemeckis, that is, say, over their dead bodies. It's not going to happen. Um, where do you sit on that? Would you would you like to see another Back to the Future story? And I say this, and, and people who have heard me know this is my feeling on it. I didn't think, when I saw that Ghostbusters, the all-female Ghostbusters, I went in with an open mind. I'm like, hey, a new Ghostbusters movie. This is going to be awesome. I didn't like it. Sure. And then I thought, hmm, man, is this going to ruin you know the palette for a Ghostbusters movie? So I went back and I watched the original, and I still love the original Ghostbusters as much as I did before I saw that film, so it didn't take anything away from me. In my opinion, the worst thing that could happen is if there's a new Back to the Future movie and it's great, we have more Back to the Future. If it's awful, I never have to watch it again. You know, for me, I, I really don't think that there will be another one, and, and I really don't want there to be. It's not that I don't think that the actors couldn't play the characters and they wouldn't be as amazing as they were. I, I totally believe that. They're all phenomenal, and I think that they could absolutely do it uh, if the opportunity presented itself, but I don't, I don't really want it. I, I think that those movies are classic and they're timeless as is and you know if it ain't broke don't fix it and they've all made it pretty clear that they're of the same mind and i totally support that 
Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I, it, the thing is, I'm not rooting for one, but I'm not rooting against it either. If it were to happen, I'm going to go into it with an open mind, right? Um, but again, sure. y- you you finally answered the question that all of us around the world have wondered forever. You got the answer. The Ryan Parker on Twitter. Um, anything, anything else? Anything that you'd like to promote or plug while you're on here with us? Uh, no, just uh, the the Hollywood Reporter. Um, it's a it's fantastic publication, and we're often doing you know great breaking news and huge investigative pieces and we just run the gamut and have some tremendous talent so i just encourage everybody to check it out all right well that is the ryan parker on twitter ryan thank you so much for coming on the show thank you so much take care What's up, this Booker T, two-time Hall of Famer. I know you're checking out the shine, checking out the gloss. I want to thank you guys for checking out Row on YouTube. Hey, don't forget to click and subscribe to check out all the latest content right here each and every week. Now, can you dig that, sucker?